So, folks, why don't we start? I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Vince Iluzzi, and I live up on the Canadian border, as far from here as you can get. But I'm very happy to be here with my colleagues, the Senate Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs Committee. We're, in uh, essence, the Commerce Committee of the Vermont Senate, and therefore interact most closely with the business community and those who are trying to grow and make the economy more vibrant. Uh, we're here today because your two state senators, uh, Peter Galbraith, who serves on the committee, and Jeanette White, who serves with us in the 30-member Senate, thought it was important to hold a hearing here in Wyndham County to start uh, talking, at least from us at the State House level, about the future of Vermont Yankee. Now, last year there was a, a vote held in the Vermont Senate, and the vote was decidedly uh, against the uh, state relicensing process uh, for the plant. That's news that you folks know a lot uh, better than I do. So the official position, really, of the governor and, and the state legislature is that Vermont Yankee uh, will close on its uh, scheduled uh, date uh, of March uh, 2012. Now, we all know that that, in fact, is something that may be beyond the exclusive control of the state of Vermont because of federal preemption and uh, perhaps the involvement of the NRC and a federal court in Washington, D.C. or uh, New Orleans or, or elsewhere. But nonetheless, uh, we felt it was our responsibility to really start talking about how we're going to transition the economy in this region to a post-Vermont Yankee era. And that's why we're here today, and I'm pleased to uh, be here with my colleagues, and I'll uh, introduce uh, them at this time. To my far left is Senator Bill Karras from Rutland County. Many of you may know his family company, Karras Real, with operations in Vermont and other locations in the United States and Canada. Uh, Senator Peter Galbraith, who I'm going to ask to say a few words in just a moment as one of your two Wyndham County Senators. Uh, Senator Bill Doyle, who's the Dean of the Senate, has served since uh, 1969 and was elected the same time that Dean Davis was elected Governor of Vermont. So he's got the institutional memory that keeps us on track. And of and course, served with, with Bob Gannett. And, served, and, 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 and Bill and I <laughs> served with Bob Gannett, Dave Gibson, uh, Bob Gibson, of course, and Dave were the secretaries of the Senate. We, we, I've been there myself for a few years. I got elected the same night as Ronald Reagan. I hate to say that in this crowd, but <laughs> that, anyway, that's the reality. I was 26 years old at that time, and I've served in the Senate for 30 years. And on, on my far right, not politically, but <laughs> geographically, <laughs> geographically is Senator Jeanette White. So I'm going to uh, ask uh, both uh, Senator Galbraith and Senator White to say a few words since we're in their community and uh, they're, uh, in essence, our host uh, for this afternoon's meeting. So, Senator Galbraith, thank you very much. Uh, Senator Lucy, I want to thank you for uh, holding this hearing. Uh, in the very first meeting of your committee, I, as a brand new member, uh, you asked if uh, members of the, if any of the members had specific issues, and I said, yes. Uh, here in Wyndham County, we are uh, going to lose a very significant employer, a very significant contributor to our economy, as a result of a decision that the state is taking. One, <clears throat> I want to stress that I support, that is supported by, by an overwhelming majority of the people of this county. But it is nonetheless a state decision, uh, and that the state has an obligation to assist us with the uh, transition. Uh, after all, if, if uh, IBM, the largest employer in the state, when it asks for a road, the response from Montpelier is uh, usually two lanes or four. Uh, and so we'd like to have some of the same consideration. And I commend you, for, uh, Mr. Chairman, for uh, responding uh, so quickly. Uh, in the course of the, my campaign last summer for the position to which you have now hired me, uh, I stress that while the issue of Vermont Yankee it has itself been very divisive, and it, I remember it is divisive from the 1970s all the way through to the, the last decade, we, we, we have something in common uh, in wishing to make sure that, uh, that, that it's 
its departure is uh, not going to be damaging to our economy. We all want good jobs, uh, uh, just as we want a, a safety and a clean environment. Uh, we certainly would like as many of our friends and neighbors who work at the plant, even if those who disagree about whether the plant should continue to operate, uh, we'd all like as, we'd like as many of them to stay uh, as wish to stay. In fact, we'd like everybody who wants to stay to stay, recognizing that for many people they have highly specialized skills and they're going to be uh, other job opportunities. And we want to think about and look at uh, how our economy, what, how we want the Wyndham uh, County economy to be, uh, and certainly in my view, to capitalize on the things that are so special about Wyndham County. It's great natural beauty, uh, our excellent schools and public services, uh, the strong sense of community, our, our educated workforce, and as we toured this morning, uh, facilities that uh, the BDCC has, uh, our very entrepreneurial population. And it, that is the purpose of, this, of these hearings, to look forward not to re-argue the issue. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to just ask uh, before we begin for everybody to mute or turn off their cell phone for somebody who lives up the West River Valley that I often forget because, uh, as uh, I point out, that we have worse cell phone service in Wyndham County than we do and than exists in East Timor and Afghanistan, two of the poorest countries in Asia. But I am pleased to report that that's about to change. Yesterday, the Economic Development Committee reported out a bill that Senator Aluzzi took the lead in, and I was very happy to support it, to clear away uh, the uh, regulatory hurdles, not without taking away the environmental protections, but to speed up the process so that uh, by 2013, uh, we will have full uh, broadband coverage uh, throughout Wyndham County and the other uh, unserved and underserved areas of Vermont. Uh, I say that, uh, and, and I actually think, think this will, will really happen. I had a friend uh, over at uh, my house for New Year's Eve, and he's, uh, he's actually a top-ranking Democrat in the U.S. House, and he, he was vacationing in uh, uh, Mad River Valley, and he said he was coming down to visit me. He said, oh, is that guy a politician? He, he, I, he said, yeah. Uh, he said, well, you know, all those politicians in Vermont, they always promise that they're going to have broadband and cell phone coverage, but then nothing happens. But this time, it really is going to happen. There's $160 million in federal money. It's use it or lose it. And one of the things that, that uh, the bill that we've just reported is to make sure uh, that we can use it. And as that comes, I think it will have a significant impact on our economy, and I think we need to think about it, because, because of our location, because of our sense of community, because of our beauty, this is an attractive place for people to do 21st century jobs. Uh, and many of, of the people who will do them want to do it in the more rural areas of our county, because uh, that's part of the attraction. And so it, I think it is something that will begin to reshape our county, and I think it's one of the things we should focus on and we took a very important step yesterday. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Galbraith. And uh, uh, Senator White, any comments that you'd like to make? Thanks. I'm going to stand up, though, so I can see you. But uh, I just want to thank you all for coming here today to talk about this topic and thank the committee for coming down here to actually um, up there. We talk a lot about the uniqueness of Wyndham County and how great it is. But to get them actually to come down here so that they can see it for themselves is really nice. Um, the oh, a couple um, over the past years, the legislature has commissioned studies on the economic impact of the closure of Vermont Yankee, and there are those studies that we can look at. But they focus uh, primarily on the entire state and don't focus just on Wyndham County. In addition to that, what we've seen is that the Wyndham County people, the BDCC and the Wyndham Regional Commission, and a lot of people from all over the county have been working on the, um, in the economic future of Vermont, or of Wyndham County, for a long time here, for the last um, 
three years and have been doing a wonderful job. If you haven't been involved in that, contact Barb Sondag or Jeff Lewis or somebody because it's a pretty exciting project. And so putting those two things together, I think is important for us to look at the impact of the closure of Vermont Yankee. And, and while they've been working on that, the, impact, the closure of Vermont Yankee certainly hastens the need for us to, to look at what the economic impact will be. And I just want to mention that I believe at the um, next VSNAP meeting, one of the topics will be, uh, VSNAP is the Vermont State Nuclear Advisory Panel. And one of the topics will be looking at the plan for the closure of Vermont Yankee, and that includes the economic impact. I, am I right about that, Jim? I was told this morning by a I member of. Been said yet, but that's supposed to be one of the main topics. Yeah. So that will be on the agenda again next month for that. For next the month or in June? Oh well, whenever they meet. I don't know. They're meeting more regularly now. They talked about it last night. They said June. June. We have a new commissioner, so they're actually meeting. But in any case, I want to thank you for coming and. Um, Hopefully, you'll have um, good information for us. Thank you. Great. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Jeanette. So we have a, a proposed uh, order and uh, time schedule. Unless there's some objection or someone has to leave, uh, I'll just simply follow the course that has been set for us. And first is uh, Jeff Lewis and Barbara Sondag. Uh, Jeff, of course, is the ED of the Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation, and Barbara is the town manager for the town of Brattleboro. So if you folks would like to make a brief introductory uh, presentation of, the, uh, uh, of defining uh, the regional conditions and challenges uh, for, uh, for us, and we thank you for helping to set the meeting up today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to Wyndham County. It's a great honor for uh, all of us to have you here, and I hope you've enjoyed your day. We tried to bring the sunlight out. I, I did want to say, Southern Vermont, usually it's 85 down here, but we did put snow on the ground so you'd feel at home. <laughs> uh, we became interested in this issue uh, through our Southern, Southern, Southeastern Vermont Economic Development Strategy Group, known fondly as SEVEDS, that uh, Jeanette has referred to. Uh, when we began to look at the fact that Wyndham County has, over the last 10 years, lost employment. Uh, uh, lost employment. We have not grown in terms of the number of jobs. Our average wage is lower than the nor northern New England wa average wage by... About $3,000. About $3,000. And when we look at, around and see what events are going to come at us in the future, one of the big ones is that Vermont Yankee is vulnerable. Their state policy now suggests it will close soon. There's a lot of game to be played, but still, at some point, because that's the way with these plants, it will not be there. And we need to think about that. We have not so far, as uh, will be said later. This is a very, it's a very difficult topic to talk about an industry that's been a core to an area for 40 years, to talk about it not being here. It's also been somewhat conflict-ridden in this area, but even leaving that out of account. A, a, a local industry that had served an area well, provided good jobs, very, very hard to talk about it leaving. So this took a lot of energy to get to. So we appreciate your help in, in a, assisting us in addressing a very key topic. So we see this, whether it's in, in 14 months or 20 years, as a significant impact in our employment and our average wage, and therefore we are deeply concerned. For that reason, uh, we thought it was important to talk about this. We approached you, Peter raised it, so we're, we're pleased to have the conversation. Um, as we talked about earlier, the Sevets process had began by, um, with the idea that we would be um, setting some setting some goals. We we're looking at our looking at that. Uh, what does Wyndham um, County look out like now? And as Jeff said, uh, we're in the last 10 years, we've added about 200 people, and we've lost jobs. And our income, our average wage is, is lower. Um, then it's one of the lowest in the state of Vermont. And, and there's no reason for that to be. Um, we have set, the Sevets process has set three goals. Um, the first is to reverse that current trend of population. 
um, so that by 2015, we're actually um, are back at our 2009 population. Um, the second goal is with wages. We want to achieve parity with the Northern New England average wage by 2015. Um, to do that, um, we have been told by some economists that what we would need to do is create approximately 670 new jobs at about $44,000 a year. We would have to create about 450 new jobs at $40,000 a year. And we would have to increase um, by $5,000 a year approximately 4,500 jobs. Um, in addition, one of our third goal is to increase our regional GDP. Um, we need to be adding value to things here. Um, and we need to increase that. We need to be looking at a job is not just a job, it's a job. We need um, to be looking at um, good paying productive jobs. And that those are actually our um, our goals for where we currently are in our economy. Um, that's what we need. I'd like to add that the, all the additions that uh, Barbara just went through total to an additional growth in earned income of $69 million a year, which happens to be just about the same wages paid by Vermont Yankee. So uh, we, we intended to add on the current base $69 million. <coughs> Should they close, we will have to add twice as much. So just gives you a sense of the hill before us. A couple of facts about Vermont Yankee itself as an employer. It is uh, one of the largest private employers in the county. It pays <clears throat> the most robust wages. It has a very, very stable and high quality workforce. They are generous both as a corporation and as individuals to the community. Uh, they, they create value, not only in the sense they create electricity that's sold out of here and therefore bring revenue in here, which ends up with energy. Uh, but they but they are a significant significant component of our economic community losing them will be to watch a partner leave so you just have to think about the emotional weight here without there are lots of other issues around that but there's emotional impact uh, to this decision all right well thank you both very much okay. and uh, I'm sorry so yeah, I'll break um, I wonder if you have some thoughts either that you'd like to share with us now or uh, in the future as to what the state might do, state actions that you think would be constructive in uh, uh, assisting us with the transition. We have a few, and I, we should be honest that we've been at this only a couple of months because it's a hard discussion. What we'd like to do is come back at that, and after you've heard from some other folks, we'll offer a few things in a process that we have in mind to get us to the place where we can have a constructive conversation about how we how we can go forward. Yeah, th this will be a, a question I'm going to pose to the uh, various witnesses, recognizing that the state has limited resources. But uh, as the community considers this, I, I think it, one of the things to focus on are concrete actions. Yes that the state of Vermont might take that would benefit our local economy as we make this transition. I, I think you'll find your next witness to be extremely helpful in that. And if I could just very briefly add, just to, um, I am I'm the town manager in Brattleboro. I also am the chair of the seventh process, which is a county um, organization. Um, we, have, we are not silos anymore. We need to be addressing and looking at these economic development issues as on a more regional basis. Um, the Subbits process that we're with, um, working with Vital Economies is an asset-based economic development strategy. Um, it is looking at what are our assets mm -hmm. and how do we leverage those um, to right. create those good paying um, jobs that, that, that all of our citizens deserve. Um, and so I, I think we're, that in itself is, a, is one aspect of this. Can I, aspect let, of this. Uh, let me just ask a brief question because it's a question that's, that other people have asked, and that is, why, why is it why why is it the decision of this committee to hold a hearing here today uh, the catalyst that's started this discussion? I mean, you say it's been started for the last couple of months. We started 
planning uh, this trip two months ago, and I'm just wondering why it didn't start before. I think that's, that's an excellent question. As I said, addressing the questions of the, of the potential closure of a major business that has been a part of the community mm -hmm. for years mm -hmm. is very difficult. Mm -hmm. No one at the silver mine in Colorado wants to talk about the day when the vein of, of silver runs out until mm -hmm. the company closes the doors and says we're done. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the coal mines in Pennsylvania, with DHL in Dayton, Ohio, et cetera, mm -hmm. and so forth. Okay. It's a very difficult conversation. So in a sense, the, Peter is raising this in his campaign, and the committee's response mm -hmm. that this is a key issue has, in fact, helped to elevate it and bring us to a discussion that we think is highly relevant. So okay. we were ready to enter it. You helped us do that. Okay. Thank you. Go I ahead. would also just really briefly like to say that the, the SEVETS process has, has been in, yeah. going on for about three years. It's a different process. It's, um, this is a sub um, a special task force of that of that process. Okay. Um, but we have been looking at it. And I don't think you could just look at one, one area without really starting with the whole package. Okay. Well, thank you both very much. Uh, next on the agenda, again, without objection, is uh, Dr. John Mullen. Dean of the Graduate School at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And uh, thank you for coming, Dr. Mullen. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. And as I understand it, your presentation, you were the author of the Yankee Row Decommissioning Study. Is that correct? Uh, I, I did an analysis of it, yes. Okay, so the floor is yours. Thanks for joining us. All right, thank you. Um, what I would like to start is, is really to talk in an overview, overview way of what the, the impacts of the clothing typically are. We've looked at this one and we've looked at others as well. And the first thing is that we're going to find is that the jobs that, that uh, are, will leave um, will be very difficult to replace because of very, very high income, very much higher than the average that you have here. Uh, plus, those workers are very, very highly skilled and in demand for other places. And based on the experiences we've seen elsewhere, um, they have left. Those that have stayed tend to be, tend to be those who are committed to the region in terms of love of place. Uh, and there will be some of them. And that or they're, or they're, they're locked into a mortgage or their kids are in the, that, those grade levels where, where moving is too difficult. Uh, so that we're going to, you, there will be some. But, but overwhelmingly, those professional jobs will leave. A secondary impact of this is that even those who are the junior administrators or the administrative assistants tend to have a higher wage than that is across that you find typically here. Um, they will stay, but they will, and they will find jobs at a lower rate. So there will be, there'll be some decline in terms of, of that. So the first thing is, is that there will be a major hit in the upper level um, of, uh, of employment here. The second is, since one of the things that we find is that the people at the plant tend to have great medical programs. That when they leave, the jobs that tend to come uh, have, less, have fewer medical programs and this is something that has serious consequences um, over time. And that is, what happens to the, to, the, to in terms of, of medical assistance for those people that are left? Um, we are finding it now across uh, New England where a very educated second spouse will take a job well below their skill level simply to make sure that one person in the family has that medical plan. And, and I think in one of the beauties, one of the good things about nuclear plants is that they have great, great medical programs. We see that. The question that comes up is the decommissioning process, and I don't know what that's going to be, but in many cases, it's over a long period of time, and that often provides a great amount of jobs, and I think as the studies go on in terms of the impact of this, this is something that, that has to be determined because those jobs happen to be well paid as well. And that may be so that what I'm saying is if decommissioning goes over a long period of time, then the, the, the absolute number of jobs lost uh, will, will be far fewer. I think a key element also is that uh, what we've found, in, in every circumstance is different, but for every one, for every two jobs that were at Yankee Row in the region, uh, another job was created. So that what happened was it was a, it was a 0.5 uh, multiplier. And that others may come out with higher figures, but ours, that's what it came. And so what it, what it meant is that two jobs lost at, at a Yankee means one in the economy. And so um, it, the impact there uh, will, will spread. 
I think another key factor is, and again, I don't know about Yankee, uh, Yankee Vernon, uh, but in, in Yankee Road, the company had a local purchase policy. And they bought as much as they could across Franklin County, Massachusetts. And indeed, what happened was when they left that, that depths, it was like not death by a, a, a thousand cuts, but certainly pain by a thousand cuts. And so we, we, saw, we saw that that, uh, that, hap that was happening. I think another key element that you're going to be surprised at is, is the uh, impact on charities. Um, and, and that, uh, again, Yankee Row had a policy of, of, of supporting its workers uh, in terms of charities across the, across the county. And, and again, Yankee Row people did not live just in Row, but they lived throughout. So again, it was in, small, it was in Little League team sponsorships, it was in Red Cross donations, and it was really in that, in that, that social sector of the economy, uh, which is so important, um, that again, was in bits and pieces, but it is something, something that, that, that we, uh, um, we, we saw. Um, I think that the question that comes up often to us is what happens in terms of the tax base. Um, typically, in other places that we've looked, uh, you'll start where um, there's, there's a, a propensity to want to tax nuclear sites to the maximum. Uh, and as soon as decommissioning starts, the property costs, the, the tax rates, the abatements start coming. And they go down and down and down and down. And so that what happens is that by the end, you're getting far fewer tax dollars than, than, uh, than I'm assuming it's a profit-making profit company, right? Yeah, that, uh, um, in that case, the taxes, the tax returns are, are fewer and fewer and fewer, so that you see that. Question I often get is, is there a stigma to these sites after the company leaves? The answer is absolutely yes. And that, that, that's never going to go away. Um, again, if the, I don't know the nature of the property, but I would expect that it's going to be, if the rods are going to be stored on site, um, that's one thing. If they're going to go, it's another. But still, there are going to be people that are going to say the only use that could ever come to this, this property is open space. And that, um, that's something that, that, again, you'd have to look carefully at, but you're certainly not going to put a school any place close to that. Simply. Right there. I know. I heard that. I, 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 new so, school. So that, uh, new school. You know, at uh, uh, any rate, that's, that's my take uh, okay. that on that. It reminds me of Groucho Duck. When you go to a Marxist duck, it comes down and keep brave. Okay. So at any rate, the, so the, the abatements, um, the abatements there are, are, are going to be are going to be significant. So in sum, um, are you going to have a long-term impact in terms of this closing? The answer is yes. Um, is this something that the the, the the county is going to recover from quickly? The answer is no. Um, are there key things that uh, outside this that uh, uh, you should be looking at? Yes. Um, should the company play a major role? If you ask me, uh, the answer is yes. And in terms of, of helping in the transition. Um, if there, are there other things that are gonna have to happen here in, 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 uh, uh, in Southern Vermont? The answer, the answer is yes. And it's clear from several things. One is that you need higher paying jobs if you're going to, if you're going to recover and continue. And I applaud the study and the work that had been done before. Um, and it, 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 makes, it makes absolutely good sense. Secondly, in terms of, of New England, what are we seeing? The number, the number one producer of jobs in places like, I'll say, Greater Brattleboro, are meds and eds, things medical and things educational. And that uh, building on these resources makes, makes abs absolute sense. Another critical element that we foresee is that people, along with Brattleboro, hopefully getting better rail transportation, um, is that to hook into the knowledge corridor and that there is a knowledge corridor that's coming all the way from New Haven up to here. And the fact of the matter is that this is part of a long-term strategy that I'd urge you to get involved in because you're an awfully smart place. And by the way, we, we foresee places in, in here and in, in Franklin County, Massachusetts, that the starting wages, starting, starting education level that you're going to need <coughs> to make it here is grade 14. Grade 14 is the associate degree it's absolutely crucial in terms of making and have people stay stay here and, and find and find their jobs. So what point came up, and I, I understand that major reforms are coming in terms of fiber optics uh, and broadband, and I can only say this: be wired or be gone. Period. That there is not one company that I know any place that would come here today without the guarantee of first-class fiber optics and broadband and, 
and, and other telecommunications. And part of the strategy, by the way, I don't know where the, what the bill reads, is to follow the state of Connecticut and pay attention to the last mile. It's not just putting it up the 91 corridor or wherever you're going to do it, or Route 9, but the fact is assistance has to be made because you're not going to attract large companies. Um, in fact, is, is, and you need to make sure that that, that, that connectivity um, that, uh, occurs. Mm -hmm. So I will, I, I will close uh, by saying, in effect, I think I applaud what's begun, and I think there's more that has to be done. If you ask the question that you asked to Jeff Lewis, to me, and say, what would be the next thing I would do in terms of gaining assistance, the state of Vermont has done an absolute miserable job in participating in economic development administration funds, period. I think you're probably the lowest in the United States. And the thing of it is that, 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 that economic development administration funds, and it's part of the SEDS process, the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, and my take is that based on what I know, and Jeff may be able to second me on this, where is Jeff, am I right? Okay, thank you. The state of Vermont has economic development administration provides money for, for bricks and mortar. It provides money for, for, for sudden severe trans, um, uh, consequences of unemployment. It provides assistance to private companies to come in to match the shortfalls that are coming in. And the fact of the matter is that you don't have it. You, don't, you just don't use it, at least in my knowledge. I've worked in probably 10, 10 places in Vermont, and you don't do it. So I urge you strongly to take a hard look. Um, there's even money in there for economic development. It's assistance if you have to put these districts together. I, I think there must be some history why you don't. But if you go in other parts of, uh, other parts of, of New England, you'll find that the, the EDA is an absolute crucial player, particularly in places like northern New Hampshire and northern Maine. When, you, when Senator, when you told me you were from the far north, um, this is one that is worthy of taking a look at. And, and I don't know why you don't. By the way, I run a thing, a group at UMass called uh, the Economic Development Administration University Center. My, my, my pay is, is I get $150,000 from my center from EDA every year to assist communities in terms of the transition. You know how many states don't have them? Two. Vermont's one. And, and what happens here, is, to me, I don't understand it. And my testimony to you is that the one takeaway that I hope that you get in terms of helping the future of Brattleboro and helping the future of the county and indeed helping the state is begin to take a hard look at this because I think you're missing a great opportunity. Good. Thank well, you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mullen. Question to uh, Senator Doyle? Could you give us some specific examples of what you're talking about. What would you like to see Vermont do? I would like, the, I would like your committee to, to, to undertake a, a quick analysis of why Vermont has not participated in the Economic Development Administration funds. Anything else? So, um, secondly, I would urge that the, the, the study that has just been done um, that the SEDS be converted into something called the SEDS, C-E-D-S, which is a comprehensive economic development strategy, which is the key to the realm of entering into economic development uh, administration funds. We have an economic development in Wyndham County, don't you? Yes. Do well, you want to comment on that? Um, on what Wyndham County is doing now? Yes. I think it's doing a great job based on this. It's a major step forward and it to be applauded. So the county's doing well, but the state's not. Well, I'm not ready to say that. Um, <laughs> but if you showed me what the other things the state is doing, then I'd comment. Okay. Okay, thanks, Dr. M oh, Senator, uh, Senator Galbraith, I'm sorry. Uh, you, you said that um, uh, it would be important to get the company to play a role in the transition. Uh, how does one do that? Well, I think the first thing is, is, is there's two ways that, that, that this could occur. One is to ask. And look, you know, that the part of corporate policy is coming in, part of and is, is helping on the way in, and the second is to help on the way out. And that the thing is, 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 in terms of what am, what am I talking about here, I think that clearly that uh, continuing, continuing to work in, in, the, in the policies that they have now without cutting them back in terms of the social commitment to, to, to communities to voluntarily continue to participate for in, in terms of paying things while they are going through the transition. So they have to see, that they have to see they work the good citizen standpoint. The second part of that, I would not be afraid to embarrass them if they're not. I, 
I, I think that's a, a very Im important point you make, and I think it underscores the importance of the hearings that we've had. So far, the debate in this community has been largely uh, us versus them. I mean, it's been two sides of, of the issue. Should they continue or should they be shut down? If we accept now that the decision has been made by the state that they will be shut down, and that decision is not going to be changed, then we can work together to talk about the, about the transition. Uh, now, of course, this may be litigated, uh, in which case the decision will be made by the courts. But it, it's, it's beyond us, and so we at least can advance the conversation, and I would hope that the company then would participate in, the, in that same spirit. The difficulty that we've seen is to separate things nuclear from things corporate. And the things nuclear, everyone has, has their own, own concerns where, where things are going to be stored, how things are going to be moved, and so forth. That is going to be contentious. But I think the other part is, pre, is looking at the company as, as, a, as a good company with a good corporate set of social policies and trying to, to work that goodwill. Very difficult. Because I, I, I'm sure as I'm sitting here now, the area will be contentious. But to work that as long as you can on the social side and, and put in the, the, the nuclear issues on the other side, if you can. All right. Thank you, Dr. Mullen. You're welcome. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Next on the agenda is uh, Sharon Hudson uh, and Oli Olson, if, uh, if that's correct. They were, they, at the last minute, they were unable to come, Senator. I'm sorry. I meant to tell you earlier. Okay. So uh, you, I'll just move to the next. Okay. So... Um, Next on the agenda is, 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 is the topic is the history and concerns about site cleanup. And f for that topic, we have Chris Campney, Executive Director of the Wyndham Regional Commission. Thank you, Chris, Thank for you. coming. Thank you, Senators. Um, I have prepared comments, which I'll read and then give you copies of um, after I'm done. Um, my name is Chris Camp and I'm Executive Director of the Wyndham Regional Commission. Uh, and on behalf of the Commission, I want to thank the Senate Committee uh, for holding this hearing in our region to address concerns related to the economic impacts of the eventual closure of the Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Station. I'm here today to share with you positions developed by the Wyndham Regional Commission through conversations among diverse stakeholders within our region over the last five years concerning the eventual decommissioning of the plant. The positions I'll be referencing relate directly to economic concerns associated with the eventual plant closure, whenever that may be. The Winter Regional Commission's mission is to assist towns in southeastern Vermont to provide effective local government and work co cooperatively with them to address regional issues. Our region includes 27 towns in Wyndham, Windsor, and Bennington counties over an area of approximately 920 square miles. These towns choose to be members of the commission, and it is the select board to appoint town representatives to the Wyndham Regional Commission. In the absence of county government, we provide the essential link between local, state, and federal government, and this is a role we've played in ensuring the Wyndham region has a voice in issues related to Vermont Yankee. The commission is organized around a strong committee structure. These committees are where most of the work gets done and the decisions made. Commissioners serve on these committees and make the decisions. The Commission has 10 highly qualified staff with more than 80 years of combined professional experience who provide support to these committees. The Commission's work on issues related to Vermont Yankee has been spearheaded by our Energy Committee. This committee is comprised of commissioners from throughout the region with diverse backgrounds and perspectives, including a resident of Vermont and employee of Energy, a former member of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and a staff person of the New England Coalition. The Wyndham Regional Commission has not taken a position on whether or not the plant should remain open. And in so doing, we have established a strong reputation for neutrality among outside stakeholders. Through our participation in public service board dockets, we have developed an exceptional understanding of issues related to Vermont Yankee. We recognize the important contribution of the Vermont Yankee Station to individual municipalities, the Wyndham region as a whole, the state of Vermont, and communities in the adjoining states of New Hampshire and Massachusetts. We are certain your committee understands that the economic impacts of the Vermont Yankee Station are profound within our region. You've probably reviewed a variety of economic data points from different sources. Let me share with you some of the data we've been working with. The Vermont Yankee plant employs 642 workers, 
with approximately 270 of those workers residing in the Wyndham region. The plant hosts roughly 2% of all jobs in Wyndham County, and it is responsible for roughly 5% of regional wages, with a payroll of about $60 million. Intergen's employees are strong supporters of local charities, and the company has significant real estate holdings in Vernon and Brattleboro. Vermont Yankee has an annual property tax liability of almost $6 million, with $1.24 million paid to Vernon and $146,000 paid to Brattleboro. Many of these payments move through our communities and are multiplied in their effect. According to the Vermont Department of Public Service, Vermont Yankee supplies approximately one-third of Vermont's electrical requirements under a power purchase agreement with the Vermont uh, Yankee Nuclear Power Corporation, which resells 55% of the power to Vermont's two largest utilities. The power purchase agreement extends until early 2012, when Vermont Yankee's operating license is scheduled to expire. The station occupies land along the Connecticut River that is of substantial economic value. The long-term beneficial commercial development and use of this land is important to the state and the region. It is the Wyndham Regional Commission's position that any, de any delay in returning this land to productive use following the eventual closure of the plant would have negative effects upon the economy of the state and the region. We recognize that the plant is privately held and as, as such, the state is not in a position to dictate how the site is to be reused. However, a full and complete understanding is needed regarding the financial and decommissioning responsibilities held by Intergy Nuclear Operations Incorporated, also known as ENO, Intergy Nuclear Vermont Yankee LLC, rep, uh, referenced variously as ENVY or EVY, and the responsibilities of the corporate parent, Intergy Corporation. The Wyndham Regional Commission is concerned that Intergy officials have expressed a belief that only ENVY holds responsibility for decommissioning, while the Certificate of Public Good was issued to both ENVY and ENO, and events since the approval of the Certificate of Public Good give rise to a greater recognition that the parent company material, materially participates in operational decisions. It is the WRC's position that Intergy Nuclear Vermont and Yankee LLC, Intergy Nuclear Operations Incorporated, and Intergy Corporation should be held jointly and severally responsible for all obligations, including decommissioning to Vermont standards. It must be ensured that the decommissioning fund and other guarantees are adequate to accomplish the prompt and complete decommissioning of the plant upon shutdown. The WRC contends that the existing fund and its projected growth does not satisfy that need, even given the decommissioning plan is submitted in Docket 7440. So consideration should be given to requiring a more complete analysis of decommissioning costs and related funding. Could I just interrupt? Are you suggesting that that, uh, that the plant not be left uh, in a, a safe store status, but rather dismantled and another plant rebuilt at, the, at that same location? Uh, that's where I'm going right now. Okay, okay. I just <laughs> wanted to make sure I was on the same wavelength. Okay. We, we, you, are, you are absolutely. Okay. All right. Uh, the type of decommissioning process <laughs> used okay. will have significant economic and employment impacts. WRC advocates for what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission refers to as decon. Under decon or immediate dismantlement, soon after the nuclear facility, uh, well, under decon or immediate dismantlement, soon after the nuclear facility closes, equipment, structures, and portions of the facility containing radioactive contaminants are removed or decontaminated to a level that permits release of the property and termination of the NRC license. Under safe store, often considered de delayed decon, a nuclear facility is maintained and monitored in a condition that allows for some of the radioactivity to decay. Afterwards, it is dismantled. A plant can remain in safe store condition for up to 60 years. This remains the WRC's contention that prompt decommissioning would better support an orderly transition and orderly development of the region, whereas safe store would likely uh, lead to fewer jobs for an extended period and significantly more harm to the regional and state economy. Also, safe store should not be used as a panacea for lack of decommissioning funds. There remains a need to ensure that the plan for eventual decommissioning is conducted in a manner that leaves behind a site ready for future industrial development as required by PSB docket 6545. Regarding the continued finding of tritium in test wells, it is the WRC's position that to the maximum extent possible, management and remediation of the recent and ongoing releases of radionuclides, radioactive materials, and or other non-radioactive materials into the environment should be treated as current and ongoing activities, the cost of which are borne by Envy and Eno's operating budget, not left as environmental problems that would further burden the decommissioning fund. I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak before this committee. The Wyndham Regional Commission supports the formation of the Citizens Committee on Post Vermont Yankee Planning, and we are expected to lead specific efforts of this committee. While the eventual closure of the Vermont Yankee Station will have impacts throughout the state and beyond, 
is our contention that the focus of the planning efforts must be centered here in the Wyndham region. It is here where the impacts will be greatest and where we have demonstrated regional capacity to have conversations among stakeholders on all sides of issues related to Vermont Yankee and to distill facts and responses to those facts. We have crossed a threshold in the region where there is broad recognition of the need to plan for the eventual closure of the plant whenever that may be. Discussing the closure of an institution that has major economic impact within a town, a region, and a state is not easy. It is laden with emotion associated with very real impact, so even agreeing to the, that the conversation needs to be had is a major step. Whenever the plant closes, lives will change, and we need to plan now to understand what those changes, the impacts of those changes will be, and what can be done to mitigate those impacts. The town where the impact will be felt most acutely, the town of Vernon, has helped lead the way as they recognize the need to have this conversation within their own community. The WRC is support, providing support to the town of Vernon and its planning efforts as the town has secured a municipal planning grant to plan for the eventual closure of the plant. As we've learned from other communities where nuclear plants and other major industrial employers have closed, the planning needs associated with such closures are broad in scope. They range from economic and employment impacts to fiscal challenges for municipalities the social and cultural stresses and strains to the actual act of decommissioning and dismantling the plant and the oversight thereof. Mm -hmm. We thank you for your interest in these planning efforts and look forward to your support as this region moves forward. Thank you. Let me, let me, let me ask a, a, a first question and perhaps my colleagues have others, but what I, I guess I didn't hear you, you say is if the plant is uh, deconned or dismantled, what do you folks envision would replace it? Are you envisioning uh, another energy production facility using a different fuel? Uh, what, 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 what's the, you know, have you folks been contemplating different options? It's a challenging site. It's approximately 125 acres. Um, it is within the municipality of Vernon. If you, I don't know if you've been to the site, but you know, it's, it, the town offices are right there, schools are right there. Um, it's somewhat landlocked. Um, it was it's definitely an appropriate site for another industrial use, mm -hmm. but specifically what that use might be, um, that's very much open to discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, what might make sense there. So are you suggesting the site is too small for uh, another power plant using a different fuel source? I don't know the answer to that. But is that question, something but, that... But it is, it's, I know it's been positive, well, could you build another reactor there? I don't think under today's standards where I used to work in Calvert County, Maryland, where you had, we had a large nuclear power plant, just the buffers required now are huge. Um, so I think, you know, this, is, this would be part of the planning that we would need to go through. What is appropriate to that site? Uh, you have incredible infrastructure there. It's an incredible location. Um, you do actually have, uh, um, you know, the town center right there at the site so mm -hmm. there are there are good opportunities mm -hmm. exactly what could go there i believe is a matter of continued discussion mm -hmm. and is the region is the regional commission ruled out a, a a regional power plant of some of some type whatever the fuel source is we, i don't know that we've taken a I, i'm i'm relatively new to the commission i've been there six <coughs> months but i'm not aware that we've taken a position okay let's see if there's any other questions all right thank you very much sir Appreciate it. And if I, Mr. Yes, Chairman, sir. just will also join in, in thanking you and the Commission uh, for the work you've done and also for the uh, excellent meeting you hosted for me last night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, next on the agenda, again without objection, is Bob Stevens of Stevens & Associates Engineering. Is that who you'd like to hear from uh, next? Oh, is Bob here? I'm here. Great. Thank you, Bob. I, I had a note here that it was via phone, so... Uh, it was... Um, I, I'm, I'm here to provide some feedback uh, from the experience in the town of Wiscasset. I'm not from Wiscasset. Okay. I'm from Brattleboro, but have been uh, working with Jeff and others on trying to understand the impacts of um, closings. And so I had the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the benefit of really talking to several members from Wiscasset that we couldn't get to attend. For those um, of us who don't know you as well as some of the others, sure. could you just tell us a little background about yeah, yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I'm an engineer. I have a consulting engineering firm in town. I'm on the BDCC board of directors, and that really was the beginning of my involvement in this issue as a board member from BDCC. 
uh, beginning and then working on a, a small committee to try to understand the implications of this closing. So. Uh, simply as a volunteer. So are you speaking to us in your capacity as an engineer or as a member of uh, the B, B, BDDC? BDCC. The right. BDCC, right. Yes. In that capacity. In that capacity. Okay. Yes. Not as an engineer. I'm a civil engineer. I don't uh, pertain to know anything about uh, uh, nuclear engineering. So okay. I'm that. All right. Um, let me just say that uh, the conversations I've had uh, were really with several uh, former select board members um, uh, talked to, uh, there was a report done by a senator uh, who was from Wiscasset. This is uh, Maine Yankee, um, which was a slightly smaller plant than Vermont Yankee, about 450 employees. And it closed down uh, close to 14 years ago. Um, the town of Wiscasset is fairly small. It's uh, probably similar in size to Vernon, maybe 3,500 uh, 3, people. And um, they suffered, um, I think, fairly analogous uh, issues that John outlined. You have a, an outward migration of the higher paying people. Um, the local people that had worked there at higher wages mostly stayed. Several people retired, I'm told. Um, and obviously, for the town of Wiscasset, they had a significant impact to their grand list and their taxes. As they were paying 95% of their town tax. Um, so as a small community, it was a, it was a major disruption. Um, what was very interesting and, and somewhat unique about uh, that, that we heard from them um, was a little bit different in terms of the context that we have here. You've heard uh, the testimonies from Seba it's that this community is um, seeing a, a, a loss of uh, jobs, a stagnant population. And in Wiscasset, they had a significant loss of job, jobs, but they're not a regional economy. Wiscasset is uh, probably 20 miles from three different uh, small cities. Mm -hmm. and, um, and principally, they're a bedroom community. So the people that were left um, were then, uh, you know, their taxes as a small community went up significantly. But I'm told they sort of came up to parity with the neighboring communities. And although there was concern about um, uh, grand list and even housing that might not be able to be reoccupied, uh, in the 14 years, uh, they have uh, recovered from that, principally, principally from second homeowners moving in. Um, it has become the one area of Maine, I guess, that is seeing some growth. And um, it hasn't been any growth in jobs. Uh, but uh, they are, in some ways, an example of a um, plant closing that was, in some ways, a smaller fish in a bigger pond, if you will, than mm -hmm. our uh, Vermont Yankee here, where we have a really 2% you know, of our employment and in a region that um, we don't, we have a lot further to drive to before we have any uh, economic engines that are going to help us recover uh, from that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think that's in essence what. I so so to so let me. You know, I I, I live uh, I live at the other end of yeah. Interstate 91. Literally see Canada from my house. I mean, is there is there uh, is there thinking in this area that 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 site should be reutilized as a a, a source of electric electric production. Is that is that the mindset of some folks in this region? Well, I think it has come up in our conversations. And again, it's in the context of looking at assets in the whole community. That is potentially an asset uh, as a home okay. run for a distribution system, okay. perhaps other equipment. There are several things about that. As John said, it has a stigma. And, that, mm -hmm. and that's true of Maine Yankee as mm -hmm. well. They have spent a lot of resources. Um, uh, significant money in economic redevelopment, that site is still empty uh, mm -hmm. after 14 years trying to find another home for that. Right. And also, um, we as a community uh, can partner and work with the company that's there, but it's owned by Entergy. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's a, uh, it's an asset, but it is something that has to get worked through are, to see that. Are, but I'm just trying to follow the sort of the mindset of your, the previous testimony from Mr. Campney and, and, and now you. Uh, there's infrastructure there, there's a grid. Yes. Um, there's a, a town which, from what I've heard over the years, is somewhat of a sympathetic host. And the technology has advanced substantially since this plant was probably designed in the 1960s and opened in the early 70s. Uh, is there any uh, interest or any thought that perhaps uh, a, a smaller size regional reactor mm -hmm. or other electric power other source of fuel, uh, another fueled electric generating plant would make sense there. Is there any 
is there any uh, opening for, for that discussion? Yeah, I can only speak for myself in this regard because it, it's not a position. And I, I guess um, I, I think it's an avenue that uh, should be looked at as a an asset to build upon for the natural gas or something else as to capitalize on the assets that's, that's there. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe in the conversation that we've had and what I've learned through the mm -hmm. SEVEDS process that the solution to the economic impact of that loss has really uh, a lot to do with re developing that site. I believe that if you're going to find those 650 or 1,000 mm -hmm. jobs, that multiplier effect at that wage, mm -hmm. that we're going to have to do that in the economy as a whole, that we have to get this engine that we've got working out here into second gear and generating more jobs instead of losing jobs, and that it's the, the kind of things you saw this morning at, BDC, at, at, at the book press and the, at the Cotton Mill Hill, mm -hmm. that through that effort, through the regional planning of building on the assets that we have collectively, mm -hmm. that's what we're going to have to do to sort of keep this economy floating. That should be hopefully a piece of it because it's an asset that's there that, you know, it would be foolish not to try to capitalize on mm -hmm. that. But I, I don't think um, there's much chance that that's going to be the solution. I think that's a good piece. But mm -hmm. the ultimate solution rests in trying to get the rest of this economy going. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Senator no. Galbraith? What, what did, do you know what things the state of Maine did to help Wiscasset? And uh, yes. what, what, what worked and what might it have done? Yeah. And what would the residents would have liked it to have done that, that would have been helpful? I'm, we're still trying to learn. We, they, they did not have a study, as John had done on uh, uh, Roe, uh, for you know, the economic impacts. They, put, they had a citizens committee that worked very hard at the site closing uh, to try to manage that process. Um, I was told they received a million dollars in federal money to help with the transition planning. They spent about half a million dollars in economic development planning. Um, uh, but specifically where those funds came from and what the programs were, we haven't been able to drill deep enough to find out the details of that yet. But that's part of what we're trying to learn. Uh, you know, what was their experience and uh, what, what were the sources of funding and what did they get through. But I was told by the selectmen that the, that was a sort of order of magnitude of resources that they were able to bring to bear to help with that transition. Mm -hmm. Okay, Senator Doyle. What circumstances led to the Wiscasset closing? They, again, their license was coming up for uh, towards the end, um, but uh, my understanding, and actually uh, Chris Campany may correct me if I get this wrong, my understanding is that the, um, <coughs> the regulations for operating changed, and they were facing a capital investment to continue operating, so the company decided to close down early. Uh, so it wasn't a, uh, a decision of relicensing, it was uh, it was a relatively small plant. Mm -hmm. They were facing a substantial investment, and a uh, corporate decision was made quite suddenly on the part of what the town understood to say, we're done, and they closed down. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Bob. Um, next is uh, the, 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 the subtopic is the anticipated local impacts, and we have uh, three folks who would like to share some thoughts. Art Greenbaum, Melinda Bacino, and Carmen Derby. I want to let all three of you join us. Art going first, at least that's on the agenda, but you choose, Whatever you wish. choose your poison. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Art Greenbaum. I'm a resident of Rattleboro since 1971. My wife and I live here. We've raised our two children here. In 1975, I started a small construction company. We have roughly 15 employees. We focus on commercial construction. Mm -hmm. uh, I do a little bit of work at Vermont Yankee, roughly 5 to 10 percent of our volume a year. We work down there so we get to see what goes on. I'm not really here speaking about the continued use of the site, the power. Um, there have been some things mentioned that actually give me uh, some optimism and I appreciate the time that it took you folks to come down here to do this. 
I believe that Wyndham County has been struggling, and I'm not going to disagree with everything that you've heard as testimony before. I'm a local businessman, I'm a CEO of a small construction company, as I mentioned, I've served on various boards. My concern about Wyndham County is that our future is going to be jeopardized with the eventual closing of the plant, whenever it takes place. Mm -hmm. and we have to provide for it now. Um, you know, Senator Galbraith made a comment earlier, what would you do? Uh, Senator Doyle, he made a comment, you know, what would you like to see us do? I think the biggest thing that you can do is continue this dialogue down here, take the message back to the legislature, make sure that both the talk comes with action. Action also requires funding and dollars. Um, you know, the planning and implementation, uh, implementation of our region that you've heard about, I've been on numerous studies, Putney Road studies, Canal Street studies, I've seen plans. We have a great planning department down here. We have actually underutilized industrial land, but it needs to be planned for. Mm -hmm. And local developers don't have the resources to do it. So it does take you know, a bigger economic engine, such as the state saying, we want to see this area, which has water and sewer and buildable land with good traffic flow on it, become the next urban center. I was on the commission with Governor Cunin back in the 80s, and we were designated as an urban center. We have to promote that. Um, Are you referring to Brattleboro or Vernon or the region? The region. I'm okay. here speaking as a resident of Brattleboro and a businessman, but I'm really concerned about southern Vermont. Okay. Um, we are an urban center. We have a lot of good land here. We have a lot of good plans for it. Uh, we need help to further develop that. It does take time. Um, we could secure it. We could provide for our infrastructure. Uh, we can market it. And we can build it. We have rail siding going to one of the largest food distributors in the nation. Their corporate offices are in Keene, but they still have a facility here that has rail siding to it. And yet every day, we know the cost of fuel is going up, but we're not developing our rail siding. These are rail sidings that exist. They need to be upgraded. We have to be able to tap into those funds with your help. Um, you know, our greatest asset is our youth. We all raise our kids here. They have great schools. You've heard about that. They all end up leaving because we don't have the jobs. But at the same time, we have colleges here, but they're very low profile. It would be really wonderful to see the state of Vermont through the colleges put more emphasis on campus life down here. That's what sometimes it takes. Um, we've seen Community College of Vermont, you know, expand their outdoors. We need that. Um, you know, from my perspective of it, we've had a lot of positive things happen in Wyndham County. Um, Brattleboro Memorial Hospital has expanded. The cheese factory, the yogurt factory, um, all of these expansions have helped fill the void of when the book press left. And that was 600 jobs in the 70s, and they're gone. So we have to really provide for that and I think that, you know, with continuing dialogue and some money attached to it, and it can be with staff to support the development of these ideas, that's the way it would go. So, uh, Senator Galbraith and Senator Doyle, I really wanted to address your question. I could go on to a lot of things, but I thank you. Okay, Arthur, thank you. Next is Melinda. Yes. Melinda. Thank you very much for coming down, and I also have written testimony, which I will hand you afterward. And I don't think this mic is working. Can we maybe? I'll try. Try. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's the only one that's connected. I think it is the only one that's connected. <laughs> there. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm okay. having problems with the microphone. Okay. Thanks, Carl. Uh, I'm Melinda Bosno, and I want to thank you very much for coming down here. Um, you are hearing our concerns about the impacts of the closing of Vermont Yankee when, whenever it closes. Uh, I uh, am the director of the Brattleboro Area Drop-In Center. It's a community food shop day shelter for the homeless. Uh, has been in operation for 23 years. Was not around back when 
the book press closed, but it was around when other uh, large employers, the community closed. We have a long history of support from uh, Vermont Yankee from before Energy bought them. Uh, as a part of our long range planning, our board is already beginning to discuss the eventual loss of the significant funding that they give to our programs whenever it happens. And we know that this is a concern that's shared by other nonprofits in the region who have similar funding challenges. Although we receive significant support from other uh, employers in the area, uh, most particularly food support from CNS Wholesale Grocers, we have been receiving 7% of our funding from Vermont Yankee. And we have serious concerns about the kind of an impact the loss of that funding would have on our services as well as on other nonprofits in the community. In the 23 years that we've been in operation, we've been feeding the areas hungry, providing both day shelter and in the winter overflow uh, shelter to the homeless. Uh, we've had strong financial support. In the past 10 years, and that's as far back as our current bookkeeping system goes, we have received from Vermont Yankee and then Energy Vermont Yankee $206,330.04 in cash donations to our center and particularly to our annual food drive called Project Pays of Thousands. In 2010 alone, that amount was $33,300. Most, again, for the support for the food shelf. And that doesn't even count the individual employee donations, a huge donation of van loads of toys at Christmas and many, many, many bags, like a truckload of groceries. Uh, employees of Vermont Yankee have donated an additional $40,000 in materials and labor to build a food storage shed on our property about 11 years ago. And they have also personally donated additional funds, food, warm water coats, holiday toys, and many hours of volunteer time. Last year, our drop-in center served from our food shelf 7,717 unduplicated people with emergency and supplemental food from Brattleboro and 51 surrounding towns. And we provided shelter and homeless prevention services to 299 unduplicated individuals and an additional 183 families. And we don't expect those needs to get any less in the next few months or years. The loss of charitable funding from any one source in a time of increased need will be difficult for local nonprofits to absorb. This kind of absorption cannot happen by having bank sales, that's for sure. Oh. We also have a concern about the potential increase in need. Uh, the one large employer that closed uh, recently in the time that I could look back at our records was Georgia Pacific here in Brattleboro. And when they closed their doors, we saw an increase in demand for services as a result. Uh, they were not anywhere nearly as, as high paid uh, employees. And they, uh, many of them had a very difficult time finding other work and uh, came to us for services. So I thank you. I don't have a lot of answers for you, but I did want you to be aware as you consider this uh, that the impact on nonprofits and on charity in this community can be huge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. And uh, finally, Carmen Derby. <clears throat> Senators, my name is Carmen Derby, and I'm the Executive Director of the United Way of Wyndham County. Um, I, I wish to state that United Way is not advocating for the plan to either close or to remain open. On behalf of the directors, I would like to acknowledge entities' support of the United Way through the employee campaign, the corporate donations, grants, and the volunteer. Over the last few years, their annual revenue to United Way has been over $80,000. Critical funds used in funding programs that we support in the areas of health, income, and education, all areas that you've heard mentioned um, by different speakers today. I'm here today as an interested party to hear more on how the state can help this nonprofit and other nonprofits in preparation for the potential transition without Vermont Yankee. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Senator Doyle. Well, you want to address the uh, right? Yes. Uh, Greenbaum. And uh, thank you for your comments. And I saw a very uh, interesting comment of the rail sidings. That obviously is that's possibilities. Are you encouraged at all by the the <clears throat> the book press and what's going on the cotton mill? Some of the uh, some of the the developments are happening in the cotton mill building and the old book press building. Are you encouraged by that? 
Am I encouraged by it? Yes. Yes, I'm extremely encouraged by it. Uh, most recently, we have Bradford Machine, which started on Putney Road right behind Friendly's. They started off as a small operation. They grew. They are a machine tool uh, manufacturer. They're expanding. Yes, I'm very excited about that. I'm also excited about the other businesses that have been there. Um, one of the concerns that I have is that as these businesses grow, and Jeff Lewis can attest to it, and so can other business people in the room, many of these businesses, unfortunately, grow and outgrow Brattleboro. You don't see too many businesses outgrowing Chittenden County. And that's what I'm trying to look at. I'm trying to say, where do we let that company grow next to? And we want to keep them here in Brattleboro. So when Bradford Machine grows from I'll pick a number 10, and they grow to 30, and they want to go to 100, we still want to see them here. We're very fortunate. Back in the early 80s, uh, a group of business people, including the BDCC, took charge and developed the Exit 1 Industrial Park. And today we have GS Precision here, which has two facilities there, plus they have facilities in Mexico. Um, that's the kind of growth we want to see. We want to see those jobs stay here. So. Uh, the BDCC has done a superb job of developing the book press. They've taken the cotton mill and done that. I also believe that the site in Vernon has many very positive uh, attributes that can be further developed. I know how much water and infrastructure they have there. I also know that there's a rail siding going right by there. And the only organization that I know of that utilizes the rail siding on a regular basis is the Sosmo Industries and they're hauling stone out of there to serve the rail beds being rebuilt. That's the kind of proactive thinking I think we have to do on the state level. I should tell you that uh, where I come from, uh, some of our towns get outgrown and we, we lose them also, yeah. we, which to our regret. So, so um, Arthur or Melinda or Carmen, I'd, I'd like to, again, I, I don't uh, live in this area. I'm just, and so I've heard several of you now say that, you know, someone has said we need to dismantle the plant. Others, you've just said that you'd like the jobs to stay here. Others have said that there is infrastructure at the site of the plant. What ideas have you heard discussed about what should go uh, into that, at that site in, 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 if the plant is completely dismantled and the site is, uh, you know, prepared for, for some other activity? Any of you have any thoughts on that? No. I haven't heard any of it in discussion. Um, I believe there's discussion that has been going on amongst friends. I know that I look at uh, back about 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and Dartmouth Medical Center was in Hanover. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we're going to build this new, at that time, $600 million campus, and they've done a couple $300 million expansions since then. Right. I look at that, and I say, wow. We're right on flat land that's buildable with lots of water. Mm -hmm. Why can't something like that be looked at? Mm -hmm. These things take time, and you have to identify it as a need mm -hmm. to service the state. Um, I don't know the history behind it, all of the details, but take a look at what's happened with the state hospital up in Waterbury. Mm -hmm. And yet we have a campus that we're sitting on here right now mm -hmm. that should be absolutely a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. This is where you want to be. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the kind of buildable land we have there in Vernon, mm -hmm. and who's to say that, you know, mm -hmm. there is not the possibility of a major rail hub there. It's mm -hmm. flat, it's usable, mm -hmm. the infrastructure's there. Is there natural gas there? No. Um, there's a history of natural gas that attempted to come from New York across this way. Mm -hmm. I believe that also was in the mid-80s. Uh, that was shot down. I do know that at one time there was talk about um, gas fired in Pownall and in Rutland, actually maybe yep. at your area, Bill. Right. Um, you know, it managed to cross the Northeast Kingdom, but barely, and mm -hmm. I know the history behind that. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard, I think, to develop that kind of power. Mm -hmm. But yet when you look at it, um, we have the grid system there. Right. We're on a flat, sunny area. Um, I know Green Mountain Power has put in some uh, solar panels and sites. There's not much wind that blows there on a regular basis, mm -hmm. but I think if people think outside the box, mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of use for that land right. to fill good jobs. Right. I'm just trying to kind of piece together what I've heard, and that is, you know, we're going to have a number of folks trained in the utility business. Uh, we have the infrastructure. We have a site, a sympathetic town. I'm just wondering what you folks have, 
you know, I'm just trying to pick your, your brain a bit about what might go back there that would utilize that skill set, the infrastructure, the willingness of the community to host a, a, a power facility, power generating facility, maybe not necessarily a nuclear reactor, but, you know, some other source. Is, and, and natural gas seems to be one which has, uh, has some uh, presence in New England. I don't know what will go there, mm -hmm. but I do know that it almost takes like a development authority, mm -hmm. like what happened in Plattsburgh, mm -hmm. to take over the Air Force Base and redevelop that area. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very hard for us on a local level to mm -hmm. take that kind of uh, enthusiastic control. Okay. But when you look at what has been done uh, across Lake Champlain and in other areas, mm -hmm. uh, as someone said earlier, when IBM says we'd like a road, you just automatically say two lanes or four. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the kind of support we'll need too. Because we never built it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they right. said four lanes, but then three right. years later we haven't built Senator it. Senator White, you have a question? <laughs> I, I just um, want to comment on what you what was said earlier when Jeff Lewis was um, talking about um, asking what is the potential reuse of this. Mm -hmm land and um, it's a little bit different than the closure of the Air Force Base in Plattsburgh because there you had, they knew it was going to close. Mm -hmm. Here we have, what we have here is a, an owner that owns a piece of land and they're not saying we're going to give up on this piece of land and what do you want to do with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not exactly in the position of being able to, to talk about what it is. As Jeff pointed out, it's, it's hard to even talk about the whole issue because it has such emotion connected with it. And I, I have not seen um, Entergy come forward and say, hey folks, what do you want to do with this piece of land mm -hmm. in April of 2012? So I think it's a little bit um, hard to have that conversation. <coughs> okay, fair enough. Unless the three of you have any, oh, I'm sorry, Senator Calbraith, or well, Senator, Senator Karras. Uh, yes, sir, I'm sorry. I wanted to pick up um, Linda and Carmen on your comments because uh, what it, it, it points very clearly to something that the state can do. You're talking about a l significant loss of support for social and human services. Uh, and obviously that is a function that the state also performs. Uh, and it would indicate that uh, you know, here the state clearly has some responsibility to help the community. I would say to fully, fully uh, pick up the the deficit. Uh, would you agree with that? Can we get a microphone? Sure. <laughs> I would hope that the state would pick up at least a significant portion of the deficit. Being fully aware that the state is having very difficult budget challenges right now and that they're not going to go away this year or next year or overnight for sure. But I would say that certainly for my program, which gets a tremendous amount of state funding and a lot of federal funding that comes through the state, that it is going to be very difficult to find the funding to make up for that kind of a loss without some state support. Uh, and even a wonderful new business that might come in and pay really good wages and be just as generous in the community isn't going to happen overnight. So there's going to be years from the time the plant closes until possibly something else replaces it that agencies in our community who do charitable work are going to have higher demand and less funding. Um, in previously when you asked the question of what the state could do to help with the transition, my two um, thoughts that I had at the time was one of them um, is to be very aggressive in trying to support the organizations in town that are working to bring businesses into Wyndham County. And we don't just need a business that pays minimum wage. We need high paying um, jobs so that um, we can continue to get support for the nonprofits in town and um, for all the other aspects, whether it's tax base and everything else. And the other thing is to be really careful in considering your, t your cuts in, um, in the human services when it comes to budgeting. Because if we do face um, a, a cut in, in the reduction of the um, mm -hmm. income that we receive, the revenue that we receive from energy, the amount of requests, I, I assured you that the amount of requests that will be coming to our offices 
office will even, um, the amount that we're able to give to the community and the amount that is going to be requested by nonprofits, there's going to be a huge gap, one that we are not going to be able to meet. We have that challenge now um, because of, of the economy that we're in. So, and their needs are going to increase. So that it's not going to be a good place for, for us to be in the next coming year. So just um, take that into consideration, please. Right. And I thank wanna, you. I want to thank you. Uh, and uh, I mean, it, it always helps to look at what one would like to see done or what one thinks should be done, recognizing the obvious point that in these difficult budgetary times, that doesn't mean uh, it will be done. Uh, the other question I had follows up on a point that uh, Professor Mullen made, which is uh, that the company, there are things the company can still do and, and ought to do uh, on it as it's uh, closing down its operations. And I've wondered if you've had any, dis either of you have had any discussion with them about their continuing support uh, after March 2012 or if this goes into litigation, as is quite possible, whatever date a final decision might be reached on, on, the, on the plant's future. I have not. I have not. Wouldn't it be a good idea to begin to do that? Thank yes. you for the recommendation. Well, Professor Mullins, uh, I just was well, repeating his point, but thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all again. Thank Appreciate thank it. You. Uh, next is uh, Michael Kudermarsh, excuse me, Kudermansh, and uh, Jesse Corum. Uh, M Michael is from Vernon and Jesse is from Brattleboro. And also Patty O'Donnell, former representative Patty O'Donnell from Vernon. Why don't you all come up? And thanks for bearing with us. Nice to see uh, Representative O'Donnell on that side of the table. You have a few questions for her? I have to say I love being on this side of it. <laughs> Thank Not you. that I don't miss you all, but I don't miss the drive. So um, we had, uh, who would like to go first? I can go first. Okay. I'm Jesse Corum. And on behalf of the Brother of Select Board, I want to extend a warm welcome uh, to our town, to all of you. Uh, and welcome back, uh, Senators uh, from our county, Galbraith and uh, White. Uh, first step, I think, is to avoid uh, what Professor Mullen refers to in his article that he wrote on the road closing in about 1997, to avoid communities being lost in the shuffle. We want to avoid our town, our Wyndham County region, uh, to avoid the decline uh, due to the closing of BY, whether that occurs in the next year or in 20 years. And Unfortunately, so far, I believe Mullen's thesis, that is, decisions to close nuclear power plants are likely to ignore the effects on their local communities, has occurred. There is little evidence that suggests that before today, Brattleboro, Vernon, and other surrounding towns which will be impacted by the closing have been considered. So this is a beginning, and we are very thankful for that. Now, I think earlier today, you had the chance to hear and learn of the serious work that has been undertaken by the S the EBEDS, or CBEDS, I guess it's referred to now, group that over the last two or three years has uh, been meeting. They've had th three large group meetings in the last year where a broad uh, base of the community citizens were invited, as well as three focus groups to help come to a consensus on regional assets. So the task force that Professor Mullen recommends, at least in his report in 1997 or thereabouts, is in place. But I want to focus for a moment here in Brattleboro, which I think uh, most will agree is the hub of the wheel that we fondly refer to as Wyndham County. Though a population of about 12,000, uh, our numbers swell to over 25,000, perhaps to as many as 30,000 during the uh, weekdays. I see, from my perspective as I sit on the select board here in Brattleboro, to get a handle on the municipal and fiscal impacts that the closing of VY will have. And as a couple of examples, how much will our grand list be negatively impacted? What can be done to ameliorate it? How will emergency services, for example, the hospital, Rescue Inc., be impacted? How will our town firefighters who receive training at VY be affected? What is the likely impact on our schools? We have three elementary schools, and we have a, a middle school and a union high school that uh, for surrounding towns, in addition to Brattleboro, feed uh, their children there. Uh, 
we're host, as you've already heard this afternoon, to numerous nonprofit organizations that benefit our citizens uh, and residents, and many of which are supported by our local real estate taxes, Brattleboro real estate taxes. What will be the impact on them? You've heard a little bit about that. How will local businesses, our lifeblood, be affected? That is, the ripple effect of closing is how large? We don't know. If business is diminished or closes, this affects uh, individual employees in an atmosphere where we are trying to create more jobs. Emergency planning encompasses train disasters, chemical spills, etc. not just a nuclear incident. And yet much of the funding for planning comes from VY, which uh, with closing will adversely impact. How much of the revenue declined of $92 million between 2012 and 2050, according to the Economist Heaps report, uh, will be attributed to Brattleboro. Uh, and again, how can this be lessened? Uh, again, Economist Heaps says that the jobs created in 2008, that's just three years ago, due to VY equals 1,034. But how many Brattleboro residents will be out of a job due to the closing of the plant and will they be able to find a comparable paying job here, here in Brattleboro or the region, so that they don't have to sell their home and move their families elsewhere? What will be the impact on electricity costs when a large share of our population struggles now to pay for utilities? Not to mention the impact on local business owners uh, who necessarily use it to keep their storefronts open. So in a situation where according to Economist Heaps there will be over 1,200 fewer employees in the shutdown scenario, will this not have a significant adverse impact on our local economy, not to mention the state? So for me, as a select board member, these, and as a resident of this community for over 30 years, uh, these are just some of the myriad of unanswered questions, not to mention unasked questions we face. As Professor Moylan, Mullen points out in his report, government interventions typically first try to avert the plant closing by providing financial assistance, infrastructural improvements, or other support, and then to alleviate the problems caused by the closing through employment, re-employment centers, retraining programs, and assistance. However, we have almost the reverse situation here by virtue of the Senate vote a year ago. So now it becomes even more incumbent, in my view, to step up to the plate and ensure that Brattleboro and Windham County do not fall into decline. We need resources and planning assistance with an aim to bringing about a successful, mutually acceptable adjustment for life here in this region after the closure of BY. Professor Mullen speaks specifically to research and studies to provide empirical data needed to assist that decision making. We are engaged in the endeavor to begin to deal with these complex questions through SEBETS in which a broad segment of the population can participate, but we will need help. Thanks again for making the trip here to what is still a part of Vermont and lending us your attention and time. Thank you. Uh, Patty or, uh, or, or Michael? Okay. Senators, thank you. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, uh, most of the uh, topics that I was bringing to the table today have already been discussed by many of the presenters before mm -hmm. me. Uh, but being a select board member from Vernon, I must say that the closure of VY will impact our town tremendously. Um, VY is, um, as you've heard earlier, pays 53.4% of our grand list. Um, and as you heard earlier, uh, that's approximately $1.2 million last year. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, we've, we've already heard about the impact to nonprofits and the generosity of the plan as a whole. And I must say that um, every year, BY donates $7,000 to the town just for our town picnic. You know, it's one of the things that makes living in a small Vermont town special. Uh, they do the same thing for many towns or many of the towns around them. Um, just this weekend, Brattleboro held its ski jump and BY was a major contributor to that. And the list goes on and on. Um, uh, additionally, they have given us $25,000 for in addition to our fire department, mm -hmm. um, $50,000 for the senior housing project on Huckle Hill. They donated a house to the town to uh, turn it into our emergency management headquarters. Um, they foot the bill for converting that house over for us to use and they continually pay all of the annual utilities on that. Um, as Mr. Quorum mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. the EOC is not just for nuclear accidents, it's for 
train disasters. And as it was mentioned earlier, a train rail rides right through the center of town, and it would be a very easy place for, for an accident. Mm -hmm. um, its employees also generous to the community. Half of our volunteer fire department is comprised of VUI members, as are our EMS first responders. If it were to close down, we would lose services such as that. Um, teachers, their spouses work at VY, their children go to school. If the plant were to close, they would have to leave. Um, we would see a decline in our school population, which would increase the uh, cost per pupil, which would necessitate cuts in school. Uh, the list goes on and on, and mm -hmm. it's just a tremendous impact to our town. Patty? Um, you know, I just want to start by saying um, this isn't about a company, it's about a people. Um, in our town, there's about 45 homes that are owned by Vermont Yankee employees. Mm -hmm. And as Mike said, um, they're great community citizens. They serve on our fire department, they serve, there are coaches. Um, anytime anything is happening in, in Vernon, Vermont Yankee people step up to the plate. Um, when those houses empty, we're going to have a flood mm -hmm. of empty houses in our, in our town. It's going to depreciate the value of everyone's home. Um, Vernon is not a wealthy town, even though people think we are because we have a nuclear power plant. There are a lot of people in our community that moved to Vernon because the tax rate was low because of the power plant. Mm -hmm. And those people are going to have a hard time being able to afford to pay their property taxes. Um, there's a huge loss to the state <coughs> in state revenue. And, and Senator, I, I know you're new to this business, um, but you made the suggestion that uh, you know, maybe you can make up for some of the contributions that are made through state budget. Well, you know, I have to tell you, as a person who spent six years on the Appropriations Committee, when there was a lot of money to be spent, it's not that easy to get money for programs. I and, and wait a minute, we're going to be spending a lot of our time, or you're going to be spending a lot of your time, cutting budgets. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to fight, um, you know, 140 other people who are going to want just as much money for their community because when this plant closes, it's not only our community that's affected, it's all of your communities. Um, because this is going to have a trickle-down economic effect to all manufacturing in the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. So you're going to find that your homeless shelters, your food shelters, your United Way programs are all struggling to, to fix their budgets. So just saying, you know, the state's going to help us out of this is, is a very naive statement, as all of us who have served for a lot of years know. Well, I uh, want to be clear, because you're mischaracterizing what I said. I said, should. And I specifically said that should is not the same thing as would or will, because I'm fully aware of the difficulty. Nonetheless, it is worth, you, you cannot get any place unless you know where you're going to go. And so if you can say that this is one of the things that the state, that ought to be a state responsibility that is a result of a state decision, at least you have a goal. But I recognize exactly the truth of what you're saying. And I didn't say the state will, and I think it is a mischaracterization of what I said. Well, let me rephrase that the state won't be able to. Well, I, I, because I recognize- there just is not the money to I, do I that. I recognize that it, it is extremely difficult, but it is something to put on the list. Uh, and, and indeed, other things here have been put on the list. Uh, if, I mean, if, if there's nothing to be done about it, it, it's all really unfortunate. But what's the point of holding this hearing? What's the point of your testimony? You are pointing to real problems which we need to address. Now, we may not successfully address them. But uh, if you don't think we're going to accomplish anything, then, then we really are genuinely wasting our time. My point is, we can't just look to the state budget to accomplish these things because okay. it's not going to. That's just my point. It's not going to happen. It's not just the budget. There are other things that the state of Vermont can do that that are not just budgetary. I mean, I'm very aware of the budget situation. It's not just budgetary. Uh, it is. Uh, there are there are other things that the that the state of Vermont can do in terms of mm -hmm. trying to fill in the gap and promoting business work that this committee has been doing including very significantly, incidentally, the telecommunications bill and the progress that has been made on, on broadband that and, and cell phone that is part of bringing 21st century technology 
through our area, but there are many other, other things. And again, I, I don't accept that all we do is hear the bad news, uh, and then there's nothing that we can really do about it. Well, it, you know, as, um, as Melinda said, uh, when this plant closes, the money's going to stop immediately. So you're right, it, the legislature has been working for a lot of years to bring broadband to the state of Vermont, and there are a lot of things that have been in the work for, works for a long time, but they're all things that take a long time. And our problems are going to be immediate, um, and they're going to have to be solved immediately. Um, and when you're talking about hunger and homelessness, those are pretty big problems to solve immediately. So we have to look outside of the state budget and how we're going to be able to find this money because it's not going to be available in the state budget. Senator White. I just have a question for um, Mr. Corman, if I may. But, um, what, one of the things that we've heard is that um, it, it was suggested by um, Mr. Mullen that the, the plant might, Entergy might um, look to be a good corporate citizen during the transition stage and and it's also been suggested that because the state made the decision to um, and the not give the uh, permission to continue operation after 2012 that it's the state's responsibility so my putting those two things together the we it's been known for a long time that the license ran out in 2012 so what would you say is the company's responsibility, not in terms of, of the donations to the um, human service organizations and, and that, but in terms of the responsibility of the company to help with the, plan, the transition planning, because you were talking about that the, there needs to be a lot of transition planning, and how, what, what is the company's responsibility toward helping that, knowing that it is going to close, whether it's 2012 or 2022, or 2032, there is a date, and what's the company's responsibility there? Well, I, I guess I would respond that there, I guess there, there are two responses. W one response, if, if it were to be 2032, then I think that their attitude would be, I suspect their attitude would be quite different than if it closes in 2012, because it's basically, there's the door, don't let it hit yourself on the way out, is the attitude I think this state has taken to Vermont Yankee. Like it, like it or not, that's, you know, if you told me with my 12 employees, or told with my office up on uh, Linden Street, up the street here, look, you can't function anymore after December 20th or December 30th, uh, 2011. You've got to close down, Jesse. I, I, what am I going to do? I'm going to close down and leave. I'm, I'm not going to help anybody. And that, that's kind of, you're requesting that, you know, you've told them you've got, to, you've got to close when if the state didn't tell them they would close, let's say that they do get the license to go for another 20 years, mm -hmm. then, then you talk with them. But if not, mm -hmm. and they've got to go to litigation, I think their attitude is going to be different. I would not blame them. I look at it from I, my I, perspective. If you told me, look, you close it down my office. I, you know? I, I agree with you, but the... Um, it's a little bit different because there was a there was an end date there that everybody has known for a long time. And what if what if it was the NRC that didn't give the the license here? So what is the company's responsibility to help in the transition planning at at whatever point it goes? Well, it I think all, all we can all we can do is uh, as uh, Michael on his behalf, his board, uh, people on our board, and other boards of selectmen around town, uh, around the county rather, and uh, uh, Melinda and other people that are in these nonprofits, Carmen and others, that can to go knock on their door and say, how can you help us? And I think the, the, uh, the group that we've talked about, Seabeds, uh, could do that as well. I think that, that's where I see getting a large group of community citizens, mm -hmm. uh, residents of the area that have a vested interest in keeping this area vibrant economically and otherwise, uh, culturally and artistically and everything. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's what we may have to do. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't, I don't know what the response should be. I don't know what yeah. their response should be, but mm -hmm. we should go and ask. Mm -hmm. So, so when we try to work together. So when we return to the state house next uh, tomorrow, our colleagues are going to ask us, you know, what did you learn? What do the folks down there want to do? What's their thinking? And I just want to sort of get your reaction. You know, we heard from, I think, Art Greenbaum, perhaps a redevelopment authority for the site. Um, you know, over the years, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the age and design of the plant. 
there has been some concern about its owner and operator, perhaps a different owner or operator. Uh, the infrastructure is in place. There's an electric grid there. there there's water and uh, sewer. And the question then is, is a different fuel source for some uh, regional power plant uh, the solution? I'm, I'd like to get your ideas. We've kind of talked, I mean, you've, I think that it's been demonstrated that there's going to be an adverse impact in the short term and work needs to be done if the plant closes. But I've also heard from the Wyndham Regional Commission that they'd like to dismantle the site. And then the question is, do what with it? And since two of you are from Vernon and you're from the next town, you know, what are your thoughts? Is there any interest in exploring any of the options? I've just talked about a regional redevelopment authority, uh, replacing, you know, dismantling the plant because it's old or its design is not as, as, uh, as uh, state-of-the-art as a, a new facility, using a different fuel source, having a different owner or operator. I mean, what are your thoughts? I'm going to defer to, I would like to defer to uh, Barb and Jeff uh, to come back because I think they would like to address that. Okay. Uh, so I would, you know, yield my time to, to them if that's possible. I would just like to make a quick comment that it's a difficult question to answer because the property belongs to Entergy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, additionally, what engineers have told me was that if that plant was to stop when it's proposed or supposed to stop, mm -hmm the fuel rods will need to sit in that pool for seven years. Mm -hmm. right. So we're talking at least seven years of no mm -hmm. power outage and just a diminished staff in order to keep that pool operational. Mm -hmm. And then there's the dismantling of that after the fact. So we're, we're already out mm -hmm. 10, 15, possibly 20 years mm -hmm. before we can redevelop that site. Mm -hmm. Uh, why, why does the pool and the rods need to be moved while the rest of the site is redeveloped? Why can't they simply be left in their, it, 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 whatever, I, I don't know the terminology down here, the, the, pool. the, spent, pool, pool. the spent fuel pool, uh, while the rest of the site is redeveloped? Well, can you can you just end it? I'll go to Senator Karras. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, are I'm, you folks oh, thinking? Oh, I'm of, sure. I mean, I, I, we're supposed to be looking to the future here, and a, 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 the, the regional planning commission has suggested reuse of the site, as have mm -hmm. others, and there's been an well, allusion as, to as the infra forum. Right. So I'll, it out. I mean, you guys think about this every day. What, right. Right. What, what do you think? As what, Mr. What, Corum pointed out, um, this is Energy's property, and it's their decommissioning, and we've just said there's the door. Mm -hmm. Why? Why do they have uh, any reason to? I'm, I, I'm, I'm talking about the future reuse of the site. Uh, uh, you're absolutely correct. Okay. But and I suggest they still you know, need to let the fuel cool okay. in the pool. Okay. I didn't all right. Mean it to come out like and that. they own the land. <laughs> so how land. can we talk about how we're going to redevelop that land that we don't own? Okay. Entergy owns that well, land. Perhaps that dialogue should begin. Yes, uh, Senator. Not, uh, not in answering the question for this group. Yeah. The Finance Committee went through a lot of this, and that site is going to be hot mm -hmm. for, you know, 15, 20 years, which mm -hmm. means you can't do anything with it, no matter what energy says. Mm -hmm. And I heard folks here say it was mm -hmm. going to be, it's only 125 acres, mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. Is not a lot. You may be able to tap into wires. Yep. Um, off okay. That site, but so it's going to have to be a very small okay. footprint anyway um, in that on that piece of property mm -hmm. um, to be able to build another generation source mm -hmm. um, because the the spent fuel is going to stay there mm -hmm. and Entergy owns the land. They can do anything they want with the spent fuel. And you know, and, and one other point that I'd like to make is, you know, we've heard a lot about what happened to Maine, and and we in town are in the process of of talking with listers from Maine and select board me members from Maine about mm -hmm. how their community adjusted. But the one big difference between Maine and what happened um, in Maine is you heard that a lot of the houses in the past 14 years have been gobbled up mm -hmm. by second home buyers. Mm -hmm. um, but they've been gobbled up at a very low rate. And they also have the luxury of being on the Atlantic Ocean. We're only on the Connecticut River. And there's not a whole lot of second home buyers that, you know, I mean, I know it sounds like I'm being flippant, but it's true. I mean, we're not going to find a lot of second home buyers that want to come to Vernon. It's not easily accessible to anything. Okay. So, um, All right. we're I'm just trying a lot to, of years. I'm just trying to pick up information. Yeah. And, okay, good. 
Well, unless you have something else to say, uh, Senator Galbraith, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Uh, Corto. Um, it took me a long time to. <laughs> I, I, I very much appreciated, uh, you know, the, your testimony and, and laying this on the line as you have, and, and I certainly uh, recognize uh, the extraordinary impact uh, that you've described for the um, uh, town of uh, Vernon, and I wonder whether. It, you would think, or do you think there are things that the state should do or can do, or would you share the, the view expressed by Representative uh, O'Donnell that um, there really isn't much that the, that the state can or should, or is likely to do, and therefore it really isn't? My comments. Senator, excuse me, you're misrepresenting what, what I said now. I said you can't go to the appropriations bill for money right. for human services. Thank you, Senator White. That's all I said. I didn't say the state didn't have a part to play in this. Okay, so why don't we get the answer from, well, from Michael? Well, I, my comments would probably turn the discussion to a place where I believe the board didn't want the discussion to go. Well, I, I understand. I mean, it, obviously, if you had your preference, you would wish that the state would reverse its vote uh, and that the NRC would, would issue the license. But, I mean, I think we can real, realistically say the state vote is not going to be reversed. You know, they're, they're likely, you know, there's a very good chance of litigation. I'm not going to predict the outcome. Uh, but let's just assume that the result is not the one that you want, that it is going to close. Well, well let's say it's going to close next year. Uh, again, that may not happen, but let's assume the worst, and in some ways, as a public official, both of us have to prepare for the worst. Uh, what is it that, what is it that you would like to, or what is it, what are the things that you'd like to see the state do? Again, let's leave aside the question of whether they're realistic or affordable. What is it you would like to see the state do? Well, thank you for putting me on the spot with that. <laughs> well, I mean, you don't have, if you don't, if, if no, you folks want to think about it and get back to us, I mean, we're not putting anybody on the spot, but that's one of the things we'd like to bring back. You know, here are some ideas. There was some thinking out loud that took place at the meeting. Here are some ideas that have been put on the table, and you mull them over, we mull them over, and, mm -hmm. you know, we can follow up on this, try to make this a, a constructive interchange of ideas and information. I think that would be beneficial because, okay. I mean, obviously, there are things that I would love to see the state do, but, okay. you know, there's constraints to all of those things. Oh, it would be course. buying up more property or, or taking away somebody else's farm or, or you know, and, and I'm not saying that's what I want to see done, but if we wanted to put another power plant there, that's what would be necessary to... to mm -hmm. I, it, it's, it's simply, the, what I'm only asking you is to, at, at an appropriate time, I mean, this is, this is not a, a one-shot mm -hmm. deal. This is something that we have to focus on. So, I mean, the problems you've described are very real, uh, very human problems. Uh, and I think it, it is, you know, that, we, that, that we, it would be helpful to have ideas of what you would like to see done. Not all of them are going to be of the wish list as achievable, but, uh, but at least it's helpful to, to know. Uh, and let me just um, ask Representative Adal, did I understand it? Do you have a, a relationship with Entergy at the present time? No, I don't. Okay. I am actually in the process right now. I do have, uh, if you're asking me if I'm a lobbyist, the yeah, answer is yeah. no. Okay. So, um, I you, guess... When you, when you retired, I, you, you said you were going to be one, but that oh, didn't happen? No, um, I actually travel the state and do public forums with, with Vermont Yankee employees who are volunteering their time. It's not, it's no. not sanctioned through Entergy. Um, and we go around the state and we tell people what the truth is about Vermont Yankee. Um, the fact that the tritium in the ground is less than the net exit sign, and we have a PowerPoint presentation, but I don't get paid. I do it because these are people in my community, um, and I want the people in the state of Vermont to know what I know, and that's the face of Vermont Yankee. As I said, this isn't about a company, it's about the people. So, no, I don't get paid. No, no, it, it, it's, I, I, I asked not to put you on the spot. And, you didn't put me on the spot, I'm glad it's out. Uh, I, I, I actually, was, I had a question that I would have posed to 
to somebody who is a representative of Vermont Yankee, and, and that was, that's why I was unclear, but I'm, I'm not going to uh, pose the question because you're doing uh, what is a, a, an entirely appropriate and, in my view, commendable uh, activity uh, as a citizen of your community uh, and a person who has a long record on these issues, which is to which is to continue to educate uh, the, the public. And, and frankly, um, politics is not about just about winning and losing. Uh, it is also a process of, of public education. Mm -hmm. uh, and the more informed that people are, uh, the uh, much better it will be. Uh, and uh, so I, I certainly... Um, Appreciate that. Well, Senator, My, next time we have a forum in the Montpelier area, I'll, I'll email you and you can come and attend. I think let, let, me, let, me, let me pose the question that I pose to your colleague, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, you're obviously very familiar with uh, uh, the state processes. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the things that you would like to see the state do? Well, um, Vermont, uh, Vernon, right now, um, is, is charged to have rate statewide property tax because in the early 70s, the Vernon legislator at the time, there was a huge deficit in the state of Vermont. And Irma Puffer at the time was our legislator and she went to the governor and she reminded the governor that there was a nuclear power plant in Wyndham County and that the town of Vernon would love to share its benefit to the rest of the state and that's where the generation tax came from and that's why we've enjoyed a half um, statewide rate for the past few years um, on the F60 school tax. You know, I think anything that you can do um, tax-wise to keep Vernon people in their home, where Vernon has contributed tremendously um, over the past 30 years to the state of Vermont, I think would be appreciated because the people who are suffering are going to suffer the most when Vermont Yankee closes are the very people that were there and responsible for the decisions that were made to start the generation tax and help the state. So just to understand your suggestion is that um, once the once the, the plant closes down, um, and certainly if that should occur in a short period of time rather than in a more extended period of time, then presumably there'd be more opportunity for the for people to plan for the transition. Um, uh, you're suggesting that one of the, at least one of the things that, one of the takeaways we can have, one of the things we should focus on is, is the property easing or continuing to ease the property tax burden of the, of the town of Vernon or so that if it, if it's, I mean obviously over time it will increase, uh, but to, to make sure it's a, a gradual increase, not a very precipitate one. Absolutely. Um, as long as we have 40, 45 empty homes that are draining and causing a higher property tax to the people that are still in Vernon, I think the state, you know, Although if there, there were 45 homes, that presumably would reduce the value of the grand list. I mean, a lot of unsold property, by definition, would do that, wouldn't it? It would, but bills still Unless have to be paid. Right. right. So, so the property tax would reduce the state, the education tax. Whether well, my house is valued at 100000 no, no, or 200000 no. the bill still has I, to be I paid. I understand. It would reduce the, the education tax component, of this, but it would, wouldn't reduce the... Um, the, um, the, the um, the, the municipal part of it. Yeah, right. anyhow, thank you for that suggestion. All right. Well, thank you all very much, and uh, you know, give it some thought, get back to us, talk with your neighbors and colleagues. We'll have you down to a select board meeting. Okay. And yeah. Senator, I'll let you know when I'm up in the middle of the state on a weeknight, you're more than welcome. I'd love to have you come yeah. to one of our forums. Okay. All right. In, uh, town. Thank you. Thank you. In my clear, all winter. Um, we also, also, project outline and the approach is uh, Laura Sibilia and Jeff Lewis. Is that is that correct? I'm sorry, Barbara. Laura looks just like Barbara. Well, I've got an agenda here. Somebody put together, apparently incorrectly. Laura had to leave. Yes, it was me. It was me. I'm okay. fully responsible. Okay. Uh, for all errors. All right. Not for any creative acts whatsoever. Okay. We know you're running short on time, so let us be uh, as crisp as we can. We have. What? Can I start real you, quick? Of course you can. I'm kick please. it over. I'll kick it over to you. No, wanna, please. Uh, what, one of the things I want to say is I think what we just just saw and what we've kind of heard somewhat today is it's difficult to discuss the impact of the closure of a business 
that is still operating, that is still employing people, that is still contributing to charities. Mm -hmm. And it is tempting to start talking about what we want or what we all think we need or what would save us. Um, but what it, it's necessary to do is to talk about what our assets are. What are our leverageable assets? And those assets may be different from what we think they are. <coughs> and so, most importantly, it takes courage, and it's going to take courage for the people in this region, and it's going to take courage for our state legislators <coughs> to have a discussion and to face the fact that, our, that this region is going to be changing, and it's going to need to change, and it's not going to be able to do it on its own. And it is necessary to establish a strategic planning process. And that's what we are doing here. And it is difficult to establish that process when it is difficult to say, well, when? When does it start? We are either, in, in the eyes of many, we are too late. In the eyes of, of, of others, we are way too early. And we deal with that criticism. And, but that does not delay us and that does not um, stop us from looking at what is our planning phase, what is our process for the next three to five years. Well said. I can't add much to that except as we think about this, there are, as Barbara said, there's a building process to develop a strategy going forward. The county will not look like it did. There is no one-for-one -one substitution to take out this and put that in. It's not going to happen. Hasn't happened other places. Won't happen here. So the way we look at it is a couple of overlapping phases. One of them is a three- to five-year process, which involves continuing the SEVED's work developing an actionable economic development strategy. The second, built in a, in, alongside that, over it and around it and extending beyond, is a 10 to 20 year physical development process of finding and identifying properties, redeveloping, redeveloping them, helping to attract and build new businesses, attracting new people here. As you know, our population grew a whole 297 people in 10 years. I was going after a drop, right? <laughs> oh, yes. It, it, it's dropped for years. That, the gain was is the unique part of that. Barbara and her partner are two. My wife and I are two. So we're four of that gain right here. So we, we're going to give each other a plaque for having been part of that gain. <laughs> okay. So there's a, five, there's a three to five year planning process, which, which requires some real skill, research, and uh, resources. Then it's a 10 to 20 year development process, which requires assets, resources, and talent to make it happen. And we will, as Barbara has said beautifully, be different at the end. We're not going to be the same. We'll not have the same employment patterns. We'll not have the same employment centers. People have to want to be different. Now, in terms of resources, because it would be unfair to not tell you what we think, we suspect that the planning phase is going to cost, we think it, it deserves and we think will cost somewhere in the nature of three hundred dollars to $500,000 a year. We say that based on our work with Vital Economy. We know what they, are, what they are paid to deliver the work that they do now. So we know what we're getting and we know what it costs for somebody to provide that. So we can look at that and say, we need that to go further because that resource, which is currently given to us, is not going to last forever. We have to continue it ourselves. The redevelopment, the 10, by 10 to 15 year process, we can only say it will be substantial. We need assets, we need financial investment, and we need new talent in this area. Barbara and I have learned how hard this is to do on top of two already full-time jobs. She runs a town, I run a large economic development agency, and we're doing this as part of our mission and part of what we want to do, but we have the other things we have to do as well. There's a limit to what we can do. We need some more hands, we need some more muscles, we need some more brains at work. That's what we have.
All right. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks again for coming down. It's a pleasure to have you in Winter Thank County. You. Uh, make a comment yes, again? of course, Senator um, White. You need more hands and you need more money. I think you got a lot of brains here. Uh, yeah. um, actually, I, and that's true, <laughs> but what we do, what we have realized... Be what, careful that, what you say here. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't real bright. Uh, but no, what, what, we, what we're realizing we need is if we're really going to create a strategic plan, if we're really going to look at what our assets are and how they're, we need, we need data. You, right. you find you right. don't have uh, the information. You, we could do that and we can, we can and, you know, have other people that can help us with that. But if you could, if you can really employ um, the economists yeah. that, that uh, have that know where to find that data readily and easily, um, that's a, that's a skill that you that you pay yeah. that you have to pay for, um, yeah. and, and it, so and that's it's worth it. Is the point? I mean, that, right. That's knowledge. So instead of brains, let's substitute right. the word knowledge. We need knowledge that we just simply don't have. We can earn it. We can spend time at it, but it will take us, as we have learned, far longer ourselves. Okay. Thank you both very Thank much. You. And our last scheduled witness, and then we'll open it up to if there's any comments from others, is uh, Ray Shaddis of the New England Coalition on Nuclear Pollution. <coughs> okay. Thank you for joining us, Ray. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to present on behalf of New England Coalition. For the record, uh, my name is Raymond Shaddis. I live in Edgecombe, Maine, just about two miles downwind of the Maine Yankee nuclear waste storage installation. I've been a trustee of the Brattleboro-based New England Coalition since 1982 and on the NEC staff from 97 to 2006 and since then serving as a consultant to the organization. In 2002, um, NEC commissioned me to undertake a case study of the economic consequences of the 1997 closing of the Maine Yankee Atomic Power Station. Uh, and my purpose today is not to recommend to you our case study, which has its merits, even though it never got beyond the, the draft stage. It's been circulated, and um, I think it was uh, presented to the Senate um, at the time of the vote last year. Um, but my purpose is to suggest to you uh, the value of undertaking similar case studies of the three uh, decommissioned nuclear power uh, stations in New England uh, and their communities, which uh, in many ways are analogous uh, to Vernon and to Wyndham County uh, and to Vermont. Um, let me say that economic forecasts that are obtained through well-developed modeling are important uh, and the results should certainly be factored in the planning. There's no, no argument about that. Um, anecdotal accounts, we've heard many anecdotal accounts today, um, they're important uh, in, in our view mostly to access the, the temper of the community. You get a, you, you, it, it is important what people feel about things happening in their community. And, and anecdotal reports um, really lend to that. Uh, the closing of a small business. I have 14 employees and I'm going to have to lay off three. That's, that's big stuff and it, and it really does need to be factored in. Um, however, we believe that detailed case studies are <laughs> They're indispensable uh, as a reality check. Um, design engineers uh, call it a sanity check. You run a model, you figure out, you make great big plans, but uh, go try that piece of material, see how it works, or, or better than to suffer the experience yourself, go to someone else uh, who has been through the experience and see, see what happened there. Um, and not all of the um, factors, not all of the experience uh, is transferable. There, certainly there are conditions, 
at Vernon, conditions uh, in the Brattleboro area, Wyndham County, Vermont, uh, that are different than those in Connecticut or Massachusetts or Maine. Um, but one kind of has to take a note on that and then think about those areas where there are similarities. Um, so I, I guess that in some, I mean, our, there's the old adage um, that a, a little practice can do away with a whole lot of theory. Um, and <clears throat> somebody else's experience is, uh, is the best place, really, to learn. Um, in planning the study that we did, um, we posited that looking at in economic indicators um, up to five years before the closing of the plant and five years after the closing of the plant would, would give us a line or a continuum so we could see uh, what, <clears throat> what trends were already in place, what conditions were already in place, um, and then from the time that the plant closed five years forward, uh, we could see if there were any developing trends. Uh, also, we felt that um, <laughs> the further you got away from the closing date, the more confounding factors uh, would pile in. Um, other events uh, would begin to have a stronger influence than the closing of the plant. And uh, so we, we cut it off at, at five years. Um, <clears throat> in practice, <clears throat> however, it really didn't take that long to discern trends. Um, and we really didn't have to go very far afield. That is, any great distance from the plant, from the epicenter, before um, effects, discernible effects on the economy uh, petered out. Um, and, I, and I'm not an economist, but we tried to look at every economic indicator that we could think of. Um, for the host town, for the county, for a three county regional area, um, and also for the state. <clears throat> we looked at property taxes, municipal services, employment figures, electric rates, uh, household and personal income, foreclosures, rents, housing starts, personal savings, um, loan defaults, new loans, uh, retail sales as they are reflected in Maine's sales tax, um, welfare rolls, food stamps, uh, uh, home sales, and a whole lot more. And <clears throat> what we found was that the effects were highly localized. The closer you got to the epicenter, the stronger the effects. The closer you got to the event in time, um, the stronger the effects. So this is only reasonable, I think you could expect this, but it's what we found. Um, the host community, the town of Wiscasset, Maine, um, they had to do some scrambling to make up for lost tax revenue. The 95% the, uh, that an earlier speaker mentioned as the property tax donation uh, from Maine Yankee uh, <clears throat> my recollection is it was about uh, $10.5 million in the, in the last tax year before the plant closed. And um, what happened was that the company and the town entered into negotiations on the valuation of the plant as it was being decommissioned. The plant was decommissioned in seven years, down to... Um, <clears throat> release for unrestricted use, uh, or what folks around here have been calling Greenfield. And uh, over that period of time, uh, taxes went down to, uh, tax revenues went down to about a tenth of what they were, but they were still taking in roughly a million dollars at the end of that decommissioning period. 
At that point, um, they again renegotiated the valuation on the spent fuel storage installation. And the um, taxes last year on that spent fuel storage installation, the property tax, was $700,000 plus. So, and it strikes us as remarkable if you compare that to the 1.2 million that uh, Vernon is now receiving on an operating plan. So, you know, that, <clears throat> hopefully that could be explained. Um, there was a ripple effect because <clears throat> as the valuation of Wiscasset fell, its contribution <coughs> to county taxes was lessened. And so surrounding towns had to make that up. I think the, the raises in the surrounding towns' contributions were relatively small. And, I'm, and my recollection is somewhere to 3 to 8% increase in, in their contribution to county taxes. Um, for all other indicators, I gave that, rattled off that list. For all other indicators, at the county, the tri-county, and state levels, we could not find any statistically discernible impacts that um, could be traced to the closing of Main Yankee. And I think that may be uh, uh, because of several factors. One <clears throat> is that the, uh, the workers, there were 400 and, uh, at peak about 475 workers at uh, Main Yankee. Uh, this is half the industry average for a plant that size. Main Yankee was, uh, again, a third larger in capacity than Vermont Yankee. But it, unlike Vermont Yankee, and Vermont Yankee is to be praised, I suppose, uh, for doing the conservative thing in having a larger number of workers for the capacity of the plant as proportional to Main Yankee. Main Yankee, in fact, one of the reasons they got into trouble in terms of maintenance um, and you know, equipment repair um, was because they did not allocate sufficient resources for their workers didn't have enough folks to do the job. Um, but, let me see, hold on one second, and I'll be, catch up to where we were with that. Um, no, I've lost my train of thought entirely, and I apologize. It well, so we, I think we saw the study last year. Yes, did, did, Yeah, so at least um, four of us are familiar with it, and we appreciate you going through. I mean, is there anything that you'd like to say in response to today's testimony, sort, well, of, to, sort of to update your your position? Um, no, I mean, there. At this point, is is from my position with New England Coalition, the only thing we're interested in here is is not polemic but facts. Mm -hmm. And if the conclusions, I mean, it's quite likely that people will not agree with the conclusions that are in our report. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, when we put that draft out, and I don't know if it's still in this copy of it, um, we put in the invitation for people who read that report to provide their comments and, and criticisms. And that included ma the main Yankee folks, uh, because um, what what we really want to promote there is the, the value of the approach of getting the numbers mm -hmm. and, and making them at least uh, a substantial part of the base for decision making going mm -hmm. forward. Um, okay. How, and speaking of going forward, which is you know, one of the things I've been asking some of the others who have been kind enough to, to chat with us, what, what suggestions do you have based on your your, your experience over the past uh, you know, 25, 30 years. Uh, well, let me, just, let me just say this about timing and, um, and input. Um, 
there were there were a lot of uh, statements made with respect to um, the authority of the state to intervene on that property, enter onto that property. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to decommissioning, uh, the pace of it, the quality of it, the residual chemicals or radiation, mm -hmm. whatever may be left there, the, the state of Massachusetts, when it came to uh, decommissioning some nuclear uh, materials at uh, military bases, uh, passed uh, a vacancy law, mm -hmm. which basically said that in, in, with any industrial uh, project, you cannot vacate the property unless you leave it in such and forth condition. Mm -hmm. this, is, this steps away from the question of the NRC license. Uh, preemption doesn't um, enter in because the vacancy law doesn't take effect until after the federal folks give them back their license after it's over. So you're not getting into that territory. They were able to to affect that. Um, the, the situation that we had at, at Maine Yankee was that it was finally the management that decided to close the plant. Correct. And there was a great deal of pressure. At one point, the state actually offered to buy them, help them buy, mm -hmm. take that back, help them buy new equipment right. to keep them running. But um, the, the amount of repairs there, in essence, uh, it was a business decision. Right. No, Ray, we know that. We, well, you, well we, I just, we took the testimony last year, and I'm familiar with that. And I I'm, think I'm, the I'm rest sorry. Of us, I don't want to drag you through it. All that's I okay. Want to say what, is I'm that, what I'm asking you is, in light of what was said today, as we look forward, based on your vast experience, what do you? <laughs> what? And I'm serious about yeah. that. You've known more about this than all of us put together. Mm -hmm. What do you suggest that we do? When I go back to and see our friend Peter Shumlin tomorrow, he's going to say, what did you learn down in Brattleboro? What did they suggest that we do? Well, I'm going to polish what? my crystal ball just a minute and, okay. and agree with, with uh, Arnie Gunderson, who uh, is a consultant to the, the legislature. Okay. Um, and, and last night he said it, there's, a, there's a very good chance that even if the plant is relicensed, it will be shut down in relatively short order when the first uh, high-ticket uh, uh, repair maintenance item comes along. And we've heard that that'll be in the next four to five years. It may be. Okay. You know? and so, so in any case, the, the, I think that the situation where it is a low profit plant, mm -hmm. if it is profitable at all at this point, right. um, is a situation that leaves the door open to working with the owners mm -hmm. uh, and discussing with them the realities of whether or not it is really worth going forward. And with that comes the planning. Um, we worked intimately with Maine Yankee on their, on their decommissioning planning. Um, with respect to the site, reuse of the site, right. um, I do recall quite vividly that during the first sale case when, this would be 2000 perhaps, when the plant was, was first put up for sale by Vermont Yankee Atomic Power Company and Amergen, was the big buyer on the scene, mm -hmm. offering, I think, $12 million for it at the time, um, that there was a gas company, I'm trying to remember the name of it, whether it was Continental, um, that came in and actually did due diligence on a gas conversion of that plant. They were prepared to put money into it. I think the problem, if I recall correctly, was a problem of supply. Mm -hmm. um, I know at Maine Yankee, that uh, at, at one point <clears throat> um, there was a great deal of planning going forward with Stone and Webster engineering uh, out of Boston on putting in a gas plant. Mm -hmm. The problem they had was, uh, as they explained it, was they were concerned about running gas mains next to the uh, stored mm -hmm. nuclear fuel. So you have to have some you have to have some space. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I do want to mention, and just a, on ter in terms of information, Man Yankee went from <clears throat> shutdown to uh, so-called greenfield in seven years. Their spent fuel the situation was ver very much like that at, at VY. And what they did was to isolate the spent fuel pool, put in uh, coolers, supply an independent electric, electric system off the grid for that 
cooling mm -hmm. and then tear down everything around it. And the, the cooling period <clears throat> before you can go to dry cask is not seven years, it's three to four years. Mm -hmm. So they were able to push it into that, into that time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, those are the main things that I really you know, wanted to... So do you see, in your, based on your experience and knowledge of the site, do you see opportunities for the redevelopment of that site as an uh, energy uh, producer? I have no idea, mm -hmm. really. I mean, it, it, it's a narrow, mm -hmm. long, narrow site. The, the, um, it appears to be that the usable portion of it is where the plant is, mm -hmm. um, and the spent fuel is now tucked into a corner up against the plant. Mm -hmm. um, it would have to be moved, and I think that um, Entergy has actually talked about that uh, that mm -hmm. contingency. If mm -hmm. the plant is relicensed, they'll probably have to move the fuel anyway because there's really not enough room there to put what they're going to have to discharge. Mm -hmm. So, those are just some considerations. Okay. Well, thank you, and I appreciated your efforts. I just want to thank Ray. Back in 2002, I spearheaded the efforts to purchase the hydroelectric dams on the Connecticut and Deerfield rivers. And uh, some of the strongest support I had was from Ray and probably some of the folks in this room. And uh, it was the biggest, biggest disappointment of my 30-year career in the Senate in uh, not convincing my colleagues at the time to take that opportunity to buy those renewable power generators uh, at bargain basement prices. So I want to thank you for your work at that time. Well, and thank you. You know, in Maine, we're tearing out hydro sites. Mm -hmm. So it's just yep. like, no figure. Senator I, Galbraith. I have a short question to you, which is, uh, what was the impact of uh, proposing Maine Yankee on support for uh, charitable organizations in the community, and uh, how did they deal with that? Uh, Maine Yankee, and by the way, Maine Yankee at the time had energy managers. Um, they did a really great job, I think, of, of not just of um, continuing to provide um, for their, their various local charities, um, and, and eventually, of course, that tapered off. But I was surprised to see them to continuing to make those donations at least a few years into decommissioning. Mm -hmm. and, and also, uh, I, I should say, that Maine Yankee um, went to great lengths to, they held job fairs for workers, they did buyouts on pension packages, um, they uh, did everything they could to ease the transition for their workers. Um, and, I, and I should also say that, that um, the demand for nuclear workers then was quite high, but not as high as it is now. And uh, Maine Yankee found itself having to um, put together a uh, golden handcuffs program, they called it, to uh, retain workers that were busy scattering to better paying jobs elsewhere. So, um, you know, that, and that, that was good news and it, and it really did help to, to ease mm -hmm. the transition. Okay. Any other questions? If, if I you. may, yes. If I may, Senator. Yes. I just want to uh, provide you with this. Uh, News article. This is from uh, Maine Maine Business Magazine of uh, 2009, and it's it's a tourism season the worst on record. And they have some some good statistics in there. And I I, I just wanted to caution where we have run our statistics on un unemployment out to 2009 that we're we're dealing with the Bush uh, recession, and it's, it's another one of those outside factors that <coughs> you need to be cautious of when you're trying to make economic projections. All right. Well, thank you, Ray. Thank you. So that's the end of our scheduled testimony. And we've been going for, it looks like about, uh, I don't know, two hours and 45 minutes or so. But I just, I wanted to give anyone else who's here an opportunity to, to make a brief comment or I dare say ask a question, although you may not get a very illuminated answer. Anyone? Yes, sir. Yes, my name is Bob Beatty. I live here in Brattleboro. <clears throat> I'm not an expert, but I've been following this issue closely for the last several years. It seems to me um, that as state senators, one of the things that you could 
most educate and involve yourself in is the decommissioning process. There's a lot of devils in that detail. This plant is owned by a private corporation. It's a merchant plant. As far as I know, there's not been one that's been decommissioned before. It gives us a lot less leverage as a government to deal with. If they end up safe storing that thing for 60 years and leaving the spent fuel rod sitting in that pool, that's a highly an advantageous situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, Senator Lucy, you're talking about redeveloping that site. We go out the window. Mm -hmm. um, I'm particularly concerned about the spent fuel pool mm -hmm. and that being emptied and those spent fuel rods put in hardened storage. My understanding is that that would be a 10 year process that would employ a lot of people. It can start very soon after the plant is closed. I would like to see the government of Vermont, because I don't have much trust in the NRC, do everything it can do to facilitate that happening that way. I think it would have economic benefits, and it would certainly have safety and environmental benefits for this county. All right. Well, thank you, sir. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Um, my name is Bill Murray. I'm a resident of Guilford. I'm a Wyndham. Um, um, representative from Guilford to the Wyndham Regional Commission, and I've been a real estate broker in town for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And I think that rather than look at the reuse of the plant as a silver bullet or as a, a key element of economic development, mm -hmm. I would look at the replacement of the power and the replacement of some of the highly skilled workforce into other renewable energy jobs that could fill some of those gaps. Mm -hmm. I'd also urge um, the Senate to look at energy efficiency and not just simply changing light bulbs, mm -hmm. but a more futuristic approach to moving forward because this is not something that's only related to Vermont. This is related to the rest of the world. And I feel like Vermont's in a, a position that we could have a major role in that. Mm -hmm. I think the rail access to Vermont is crucial. I think the increased broadband and self-service is crucial. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see us try and not just take that federal money and extend lines without looking at how can we leverage that money into educational opportunities for kids in the career centers, perhaps some soon-to-be unemployed engineers, bring them into that process. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like part of the changing uh, demographics of the population here um, I think there are younger people who want to move back here or here. I'm seeing it anecdotally. I'm seeing kids who grew up around here, moved away to the big city, and now want to come back. Mm -hmm. And I've seen kids and uh, people who've been successful in careers elsewhere who see the largest asset that we have here is the fact that we have not succumbed mm -hmm. to all of the get-rich-quick development that's affected many other places in the country. Mm -hmm. And I think that some of the stands that Vermont has taken that people said, oh, why, that'll never work. Bottle bills, billboard bills, Act 250, um, the uh, marriage equality or uh, um, same-sex uh, civil unions that everybody said was, or many people said was going to be the downfall of the state. I think those were all things that established Vermont as a place that people look to for um, future growth. And I think that we're crazy not to look at this as a real benefit. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the asset that we have is no one moves here to get rich. People move here because they see some future here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you have to capitalize on. Well, thank you very much, sir. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I'm Ed Anthes from Demerston. I do want what, what's your last name, Ed? Anthes, A-N-T-H-E-S. Okay. Um, Mr. Mullen suggested that one of the key areas uh, of concern is medical care. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the legislature to look at um, bringing uh, people facing uh, the possibility of uh, either uh, a cut in pay or unemployment through the transition period uh, to see how they could be brought into the state medical program so that that uh, which can be such a uh, the kind of thing that keeps you awake in the middle of the night that those issues um, can be looked at and eased so that um, that's not a factor in um, causing people real distress through this transition period. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. 
All in? Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. We very much appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you, Senator.